Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good evening uh, for those uh, who are watching live uh, uh, from uh, uh, from all all around the world. Uh, it's uh, 9 p.m. Uh, Central uh, European uh, Summer Time. Uh, it's uh, 3 p.m. Uh, in the eastern coast of the U.S. Uh, so we are we have found, uh, we have tried to find uh, a, a good time uh, in order to make this live available to all those interested uh, in uh, a pretty interesting aircraft, uh, a pretty legendary aircraft, uh, uh, the U-2 Dragon Lady. Uh, and in order to talk about this uh, uh, aircraft, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the most uh, experienced guy uh, and also the most skilled one in terms of uh, photography uh, is uh, surely uh, Ross Francamont. Uh, Ross uh, is uh, a former lieutenant colonel of the US Air Force uh, with some uh, uh, about 4,700 flying hours uh, with several type of aircraft. Uh, uh, most of these uh, have been flown aboard uh, uh, the U-2 Dragon Lady, about uh, a little less, I think, short of uh, 2,000 flying hours. And uh, Ross is a pretty famous uh, pilot uh, because, as I mentioned, he has taken some of the most spectacular and awesome photograph uh, uh, aboard the, the U-2 Dragon Lady uh, at the age of space, uh, have, uh, <laughs> as I've already said uh, and written in several articles. So without uh, further, any further ado, uh, let me show you uh, Ross, who is connected from California. Uh, here he comes. Uh, OK. Hi, Ross. Can hey, you how's it going? I can hear you, David. Uh, OK, that's great. And thank you for accepting this invitation uh, to come live uh, with all uh, uh, the audience at uh, The Aviationist to talk about the YouTube uh, Dragon Lady. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, it's it's great to be here. And I might add, you you are you are the main reason that I am semi-famous for all this stuff. So uh, you, you yeah. did all the job. I just published your <laughs> your stunning photographs. So uh, you made the rest. But we will uh, we will talk about uh, how you took those uh, images. Uh, let's start uh, talking about uh, uh, yourself. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, just uh, a couple of things about you, but uh, uh, can you uh, can you tell us something about uh, about you, where you grew up, uh, school, so briefly before we start with the aviation part of uh, of your life? Uh, yeah, just a little background. So uh, I grew up actually in a pretty small town in Western North Carolina uh, called Lenore, and uh, I I decided pretty early on that I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, actually, I was about the age of four when I first got on a plane, and I told my dad that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. And uh, so I decided I was going to get myself out of the sleepy town of Lenore. And uh, I, uh, at, right after high school at 18, I went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs and uh, spent four years there and graduated in 1999, uh, got a, a, a bachelor's of science in physics and uh, also uh, uh, got the chance to go to pilot training. And, uh, I worked my, my way through uh, uh, pilot training. I ended up going to Germany after that, flying uh, Learjets. And uh, and then uh, that's what we'll talk a bit more specifically, but that's where I got the bug about the U-2 and ended up going to the U-2 in 2005. And I basically spent my career since then in, uh, uh, in the U-2, just one small staff tour in Hawaii that was a hardship tour that somebody had to do. So. Um, where I did not fly, but the rest of the time I was, I was, I've been flying the U-2 and then I, I retired in 2019 and uh, uh, I'd met my wife in California. So we, uh, uh, she's from here, her family's here. So we have uh, three small kids now. And uh, so we decided to stay, uh, stay in the same town. We're a uh, little town of Lincoln, California. And uh, this is where I've, uh, I decided to stay. Uh, Got a job with United Airlines, and as we know, the airlines yeah, have that, not been doing great what, now. <laughs> that, that was my next question. Okay. Now, yeah. uh, after retiring uh, from the U.S. Air Force, uh, uh, what have you done? What, uh, why did you retire? Uh, and what are you doing now? Because uh, uh, 
uh, you are doing a lot of, of interesting things. Um, and you are also uh, publishing a, a website uh, with all your stunning photographs uh, and recollection of your experiences aboard the U2. Uh, we will talk a bit more about this uh, later on during the live, but uh, uh, tell us what you have done after retiring from the Air Force. Uh, yeah, so I, I retired. I retired right at 20 years. And uh, for me, it was, I mean, it, it was a great 20 years. And I, I have no complaints at all uh, about my time in the in the Air Force and you know the bases I was at and stuff like that. It was just um, you know it, it was time it was time to move on. I was at that point in my life where uh, it, it it was time to do something else. Uh, I love flying the Dragon Lady. I love, love flying the T thirty eight, and uh, it was a uh, you know c kind of a, a family decision that you know hey you know if uh, that uh, I would basically. You know, I'd change up my lifestyle, get out of the military, no more deployments or anything like that, and uh, go to work for the airlines. And uh, and and it, it was a it was a great year with the with the airlines. Uh, up, I, I joined the United in uh, uh, 2019, and then uh, uh, obviously uh, some things happened in this March, and so uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, I haven't been flying as much lately, and. Uh, so I, I I'll be one of those pilots who's looking at getting furloughed here uh, very shortly. So you know as I've been I've been staring that down uh, for the last six months or so, and uh, you know I decided I, I I'd, I'd always wanted to go a little bit more uh, you know really expand what I've done with with the YouTube photos and with my experience in it, and that's kind of why I decided to start up a website and. Um, the, uh, I've started doing more photography stuff uh, in a professional sense as well, some freelance work. Uh, I'm trying to get into some video production work as well. And it's all stuff I've kind of been interested in. It's always been kind of on the back burner and now I'm kind of having to move it to the front front burner, but uh, it's uh, it's been a great experience uh, so far. Okay, uh, thank you for, uh, I, I, as I've said, we will get back also to your uh, uh, website and to your activities um, as a photographer, but also uh, in sharing uh, uh, your, um, your stories uh, uh, and your adventures about uh, the YouTube. Uh, you have uh, uh, already more or less uh, briefly explained about uh, uh, your career uh, before, uh, but you mentioned that before uh, uh, joining the U2, uh, you were flying another type of jet. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this? And also, uh, in order to start, uh, talking about the, the Dragon Lady, if your experience with the C-21 has in some way helped you or something, some lessons learned from that experience uh, uh, could be used uh, on the U-2 in their uh, next assignment. Um, yeah, so uh, like I said, the, the, my, my very first assignment out of pilot training, I was very fortunate. Um, I, I got my uh, at least my first choice once I was going through, I, I originally went into pilot training. I wanted to fly E-10s uh, and that, that didn't quite, uh, <laughs> didn't quite work out as well uh, as I wanted. But then when I started going towards the transport track, um, I, uh, I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get my first choice out of that. When I saw, you know, C-21s to Ramstein, Germany, I said, I'm going to get that assignment. So it, it ended up being, it was an incredible first assignment for, uh, you know, a young pilot, uh, you're given a lot of responsibility very early on. Uh, you're yeah, you're already upgraded as the aircraft commander within the first year, and then you're an instructor shortly after that. And uh, you know, and you're flying around, uh, you know, Eastern Europe and Europe and Africa, you know, as a 24 year old, uh, and your your uh, co-pilot's a 23 year old sitting next to you, and you have a four star general or a senator in in the back of the plane. <laughs> Um, and yeah, but it, it was a great experience. You got to go to a lot of crazy places and a lot of really fun places to, to visit. And, um, the, uh, and for those wondering the C-21, it's actually the one that's right over my left shoulder there, the uh, yeah. white plane, uh, Learjet 35 is the civilian version. Um, but, uh, one of, one of the cooler missions that we had actually called, it was called the Dragon Claw. And you, uh, our, our mission was to go down to, um, the uh, RAF base back and um, we uh, there was a uh, there was a mission flown by the U two, um, and it, it was their unclass unclassified mission. It was called the Olive Harvest, and uh, 
they, uh, they actually, uh, one of their sensors, they, they, uh, and they still use today, it's a wet film camera that uh, you, it's a, has a canister. It uses about two miles of film and it runs the, runs the film through as the plane flies. It basically takes an exposure. Uh, it kind of turns and takes an exposure every few seconds. And it ends up, you end up mapping out an incredible amount of uh, area uh, to an incredible resolution in a very short amount of time. And uh, so they flew this mission as part of the Camp David Peace Accords. And uh, so the plane would land. And uh, after this mission, they download the film, put it in the canister, and then they put it on our jet. And uh, the, uh, we had fly it back to Ramsteiner and it was, uh, was going to be handled in some way from there uh, to be processed. The, uh, yeah, but the, the cool thing on this mission was I actually got to see the U-2 and I got to see some of the pilots and talk to some of the pilots. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was on one of these missions uh, or after one of these missions, the pilot, he was actually still in his spacesuit, um, you know, with his helmet off and standing by the jet. And, uh, yeah, I just saw him and I just asked him, like, like, you know, what, uh, what kind of things do you see up there? And uh, he was like, he's like, man, you wouldn't believe some of the things I saw. So, uh, you know, and then he, he, he asked me, he's like, have you thought about being a YouTube guy? And, and it, it honestly, it never, in, in all my years up to that point, I think I was 25 or 26 at the time, uh, it had never crossed my mind that I wanted to go fly the U2 or even that I could fly it. Uh, it was kind of one of those mysterious things that other people did and went off. And uh, so, you know, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think, that stuff that I can probably do. And he's like, no, we, if you have enough hours, we will, we'll take a look at you and you'll at least get an interview probably. And, uh, so yeah, I, that was when I started looking into it and I started kind of getting excited. Like this is something I could do. I just needed some more hours to get there. And, um, um, I, uh, you know, I contacted the people at Beale that run the recruiting for it. And, uh, cause it's a job you have to apply for. And, um, uh, started looking into it, the whole process. Uh, I also tried to fly as many of those missions down there um, as I could to Akrotiri. Um, I would uh, bring some, some, I guess, bargaining material with me that I'd get uh, some, some crates of uh, some fine craft uh, ales from Belgium and stuff like that. I'd bring down for, uh, for the people down there just to, to butter them up a little bit. Um, so I'd get a good word put in for me from them. And uh, uh, you know, before I knew it, I had, I had, I got an interview, I got to go interview for the U2. So that, that job very much led to my interest and, you know, my eventually getting hired into the U2. So uh, this is the, uh, more or less the, the, the standard type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, workflow that you have to follow to become a, a U2 pilot. You have to uh, make an application, but are there specific requirements uh, that you need in order to become a YouTube pilot, uh, a certain type of experience, uh, a certain amount of flying hours, uh, or anything like that, uh, or it's uh, pretty much open to everyone. It, so it, there, there's only a, a few uh, definite requirements, uh, and those requirements have changed. So they periodically do change, but there is a flying hour requirement. Today, it's actually based on whether you're flying a training aircraft. Uh, you know, fighter aircraft, training aircraft, or transport aircraft, the, the hour requirements are uh, a little bit different. Just, uh, you know, and it's, it's basically, you know, a guy who has 500 hours in, in a F-16, uh, that's different flying than a guy who has, you know, 500 hours in a C-5, you know. It, and it's not that we, you know, say that it's better or anything. It's just, it's, it's different. They rec we recognize that, you know, based on what you flew, uh, you come with a little bit different level of experience. But that being said, it, it's really open to anybody who has, uh, I believe the last requirement I, I heard was at least 500 hours of fixed wing time. Uh, and then there's a total hour requirement as well. So we've taken helo guys before. Uh, we take transport guys, bomber guys, fighter guys, uh, training guys. We take uh, uh, guys who are able to apply from the Marine Corps and from the Navy. Uh, the only thing right now, I don't believe that we, we have any foreign pilots or a path for that right now mm -hmm. um, to, uh, uh, and part of that's just uh, having to get the, uh, a lot of the, some of the, the top secret stuff is no foreign type information. Uh, so, um, but, uh, but still it's a, it take a, a pretty large swath of people. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that makes it so unique in the U2. Uh, is you have this, you know, you have, uh, you know, 50 guys and 
you know, it's a huge, they're not all transport guys. They're not all fighter guys. You know, so it's, it creates a completely different culture. Um, but the other thing that makes it uh, a little bit unique is uh, unlike the other jobs, or I'd say pretty much most every other job in the Air Force, where you're given an assignment and you're told you're going to go to this base and you're going to fly this aircraft. Um, you might have a little bit of leverage on what you're going to do. Um, but U2 is one of the few where you, you actually, everyone has to say, I want to fly that airplane. And then you have to come out and interview uh, and you have to be accepted and you have to make the choice that, yes, this is you know, what I want to do. Because it's definitely not a job for everyone out there. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's different, you know, it, you know, not just, not just the flying, the flying is, is obviously very tough and, uh, um, and very hands-on, but, you know, just the, the other requirements, the physiological requirements of being in a spacesuit and all that. We, we try to, uh, give you the full experience when you come out to do the interview that you're, uh, to kind of show you, this is what it's going to be like. You're in a small group, you're going to be in this suit, you're going to be in a, <laughs> for many hours, and you're going to be exhausted and you're, then you're going to have to land this incredibly challenging plane to land um and you know and, and we're we're actually grateful guys who do come to interview and then uh after all that and they say you know this just isn't for me you know we, we were grateful that guys would would do that uh because it, it is a lot it's a lot of time a lot of resources to train up a u2 guy uh, it takes you know about a year or so of training and uh we we don't want guys to get fully trained up and then go you know actually this really kind of sucks and i don't want to do this anymore um but uh uh but you know and then but it's like i said it's also um for the u2 community and for the pilots you know everyone down from the the lowest you know the the you know the the latest student to join the ranks to the oldest most experienced guy all have, kind of have a say um you know when guys come to join that like hey this is yeah this looks like a kind of guy that we want on our team here so it's it's pretty unique in that that aspect and uh, uh, let me start also uh, picking some uh, question uh, from the audience. Uh, I've seen this one from uh, uh, Matt Morris uh, uh, asking, uh, did you ever fly from Ralph Fairford in the UK? <laughs> uh, I assume that the, yeah. the answer is yes. Uh, maybe uh, you want to add uh, something about yeah. it. So so what, what is unique is that, yeah, um, I have been to Fairford uh, lots of times, but only uh, I've only flown in there one time in the U2 and I've never flown out of there in the U2 uh, and kind of uh, interestingly that uh, I used to fly in there a lot flying the C21 so it, we used to take the, the third Air Force commander from Mildenhall over to Fairford that was kind of a you know I'd say one of our milk runs we do you know or somebody would do once a week would fly up to Mildenhall and carry him over there and bring him back and uh, we, we had several you know, runs like that. Um, so I had a lot of time going in there. Um, but, uh, I, uh, the one time I was supposed to fly over there or fly out of Fairford, uh, to take a jet, uh, that was coming for the United States, take it on to a further destination. Um, that jet ended up diverting into Mildenhall. And uh, so I ended up flying that jet out of Mildenhall. Um, and which at that time had been one of the first times Jet had been to Mildenhall in years. And I know one just recently revisited there having an engine problem, but uh, <laughs> that was the second time that one has been to Mildenhall in many years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, that I love Fairfair. I love, I love going out to, uh, you know, I love the UK in, in general, uh, you know, and I had a lot, like I said, a lot of experience in flying the C-21 going in there and, um, Flying into Prestwick a lot, and then even some of the other smaller bases and cities around the UK. That, uh, uh, yeah, I loved out there. Uh, there's also another question before we move forward. Sure. Uh, uh, I'm not sure you can see uh, it, but uh, it is about um, uh, how difficult uh, is to wear the U2 flight suit, uh, the strapped in phase uh, in the cockpit, <laughs> uh, and also. Uh, uh, what uh, was your what were your feelings during your first uh, solo flight in the YouTube from step? Um, okay, so starting with the first one, um, or I'm sorry, starting with the second question. So feelings on the okay. first solo. Um, part of part of the uh, once you you're accepted in the program in your interview and you you actually have to fly during the interview. Um, but once you start your training, it's actually your first six flights are in a two seater. Uh, you too. So, 
uh, you end up doing uh, uh, each flight. Each flight is about two hours long. Uh, of those six flights, and you're fine with another experienced instructor in the back. And uh, they, you know, they try to get you ready to to solo. Your seventh flight is is a, a solo, and it's just a pattern solo going around flat, you know, an instrument approach and then a bunch of landings and emergency patterns and stuff like that. Um, all those flights are actually, you're just wearing uh, a normal standard Air Force issue flight suit uh, and uh, you're wearing a harness over that. Uh, and that's what connects into the, the parachute and the survival equipment on your seat. Um, but uh, I, I'll say that uh, that that first solo is, uh, is it, I mean, it was, it was obviously it was nerve wracking, and uh, and and I probably I would say that you know the the feeling of, of landing the U two that uh, unlike other planes I've flown where you know once you reach a certain proficiency level uh, of flying it you know it, you have your challenging landings you have your easier landings but it's you're never really uh, you know you're, you're still obviously trying your best to wear but you never get this feeling like like holy crap. This could go sideways at any time, and with the U two, even as an experienced guy, even with a thousand hours, you know, I would be coming down final, you know, out at some deployed base, and, and like, I, I would say, landings can just go; they can go to shit in in two seconds, you know, or or, or less. Um, and so I probably wasn't as scared on that first solo as I was even later on, knowing you know, knowing what I could what could happen to the jet uh, if you mishandled it in the last second before <laughs> landing, um, you know, but uh, I remember being, you know, pumped up and, and ready, uh, uh, you know, felt ready for it. I had actually, um, uh, it, it was, you know, it's kind of funny now looking back on it, but I actually struggled a lot in that training. And uh, I, uh, before I even soloed, I had to repeat two of the flights already. And, uh, yeah, one of them was actually it was, it was for uh, uh, bad uh, uh, bad no flap landing, you know, and one that you know the instructor had to take for me uh, right on my pre solo flight, you know, and I was really bummed, you know, and I had to go back and repeat the whole flight over again, um, and uh, the uh, so I, I definitely felt like I had the time, I felt ready, uh, and then uh, you know I knocked out that first solo, and then you know your your training it just it just keeps progressing from there, and. Yeah, one of the one of the reasons we actually bring people out to interview them, and actually we put them in the jet. They have to fly three times in the interview. It's mostly landings. You end up doing almost fifty landings um, over the course of three flights, and it's kind of to see whether whether you're cut out for the learning curve uh, that the U two requires. And yeah, the U two, uh, it it's uh, I'm trying to think now. Yeah, it's, basically it's twenty. Uh, 21 flights to get you completely uh, completely qualified in the jet. And that's including all your mission training um, as well. And, uh, you know, so that's to go from, from nothing to a guy who's flying a, a jet solo over enemy territory, you know, have, with enemy missiles around, stuff like that. Um, so every flight builds and builds and builds. And uh, the, uh, you know, that, the, that three flight phase of the interview, it's basically there to see whether uh, you can, you have the learning curve uh, to be able to progress on that track. Um, so I, for a while I felt like, well, maybe I don't have that learning curve. And so, cause I struggled so much uh, with training. And then I later struggled with the spacesuit. So when you, when you get into, you know, you talk a little bit about the spacesuit, uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, uh, how difficult it is to wear the spacesuit and get strapped in. Um, so it, it was, it was actually one of my, one of my struggle, uh, kind of a personal struggle, uh, throughout, uh, throughout my whole time with you too, um, is when you get into the spacesuit, uh, there's, and once they, once they lock down the bar there, you have a fit, you have a face, uh, uh, ring around you, uh, that helps trap. Basically you just have hundred percent oxygen just around your face here. Uh, and then you have vent air coming into the suit. Um, I actually had I had a little bit of claustrophobia and it kind of would come and go, um, and we actually do a claustrophobia check as part of the interview. Mm -hmm. But I actually had a little bit of that, and it, and it would only happen when I first got into the suit and when they first did the first checks on it. Um, but typically, you know, when you get into the suit, it was actually a team, 
uh, there were three technicians that helped you. There were two people that basically uh, helped uh, get the suit on you and connect everything up. And then there's a supervisor watching them. Uh, and then that suit, once they're all done with the, the suit up, the uh, supervisor goes around and checks everything as well. Um, it's kind of the same same setup when you get into the jet. You actually, uh, you don't have the dexterity with your hands and stuff like that, but they end up connecting. It's about 11 different points of connection uh, once you get into the seat that you're connected uh, to that seat, to the parachute uh, and to the jet. You really feel like you, you're now a part of the jet uh, because they literally strap you uh, two parts of the jet. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it's not just the seat. You actually have, like, you have your, uh, you wear a thing on your boots called spurs. And uh, they, uh, there's little cables that come out from the bottom of the seat that they connect into that. And that's so if you were to eject, you know, say, uh, say at 70,000 feet, you know, the first thing happens when the canopy goes off is a rapid decompression. Uh, your suit's going to inflate. It's going to keep you alive. So it's actually uh, going to inflate to keep air pressure on you but when it does that your feet are going to rip out in front of you uh, so those cables rip your feet back and lock your feet against the seat mm -hmm. otherwise you're going to lose the bottom part of your your legs which would be less than ideal so um so you know so you're connected there you're connected to the seat kit uh, that you, has all your survival gear you're connected to the parachute in several different points and then obviously uh, to some vent some oxygen there's you know Thing that powers uh, your face heat should you need it if you need to have an injection. So it's there's a whole whole lot of different things that go in uh, to just getting you into the seat. Um, and uh, and again, there's a there's a person that that puts you in the seat, and then there's a supervisor that checks you. So there's a lot of points that hopefully are going to catch any kind of mistakes. And you know that kind of stuff's happened. It's, uh, fortunately, it's always been caught um, uh, before anyone goes out uh, that I've seen. So. Uh, um, it, uh, but for me, you know, the, the process of getting in the suit, uh, it was just that little bit when I first, first started doing the test on the suit, I'd get a little bit of claustrophobia and I just kind of have to calm myself. And then, you know, once I'm, once I'm walking out to the jet, I'm fine the rest of the mission and all that. But, um, but I, I will say, you know, too, that as I was getting older, putting on that space suit was starting to get a little bit harder each time. Um, so, and that, that was another reason when I hit the 20 years and I was, you know, able to re retire, it's like, I love it. Um, and, uh, you know, I love the view and all that, but it's just getting a little bit harder each time. And, uh, you know, I, uh, did it. I'm glad I did it. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never forget it, obviously, but yeah, it, uh, um, that, that is the one aspect I, I am not missing at all in retirement. So. <laughs> sure. I can understand. And um, yeah, there's also uh, another several uh, more questions. One is, uh, I'm not sure you can uh, uh, you can give an answer to this, but uh, what's <laughs> the highest altitude you have ever flown? Uh, I'm not sure you can uh, yeah. uh, you can give us uh, uh, this detail. Let's it's say more, the the more standard more. the standard air show answer is above seventy thousand feet. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. That's, we, that, we, that's we, the standard air show it. answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's that's great. Uh, there's also uh, another question from uh, Matteo. He said, "Have you ever been intercepted by a Russian fighter?" I think that uh, I know the answer, but uh, I, I'll leave you. Uh, I would love to tell. I would love to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. And uh, there's a there's another interesting uh, interesting question. It's um, from Steve, uh, who basically asks uh, um, how you can make uh, a, a diversion with a U two. Consider that uh, you don't have a lot of. Uh, uh, the supporting crew, the ground crew that is required. Uh, uh, you mean that is uh, yeah. uh, 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 that is something that you have to consider. So yeah. it's better not to divert because of this. Yeah. But uh, I, I think you, you uh, in case this is needed, <laughs> you have to do it. Yeah, it's uh, it's just like any airplane. You know, there there are certain situations that are going to require a divert. Um, I had one one very notable divert, uh, and it was. Uh, it was on a mission in the Middle East, and uh, the uh, one of the uh, gets into one of the limitations of the jets. A very uh, it's crosswind limited, so uh, the uh, uh, the big tail on the back of the U two there that uh, uh, any kind of crosswinds that that tail is like a big barn door uh, that catches the wind, 
And so when you're sitting way at the, at the tip of the, you know, the nose of the jet, you're going to nose into the wind, uh, just like a weather vane as the, as the crosswind hits the tail. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's standard for most aircraft in the U-2 is, it's very pronounced. So, you know, we have a limit of 15 knots of tail or of crosswind. And, uh, the, uh, I, I had a mission that, uh, we already knew that there were forecasts to be crosswinds. And then on my way back from the mission area to land at the base, I got word that, yeah, the crosswinds are already, I think, at 25 knots. Um, so they said, okay, you know, they might come down in a few hours. And uh, so we're going to have you hold. And so I went into a holding pattern. Uh, this, this mission, uh, you know, most missions might be anywhere from eight to 10 hours. Um, I think this one was already pre-planned to shorten to uh, under seven hours because of the planned crosswinds. Um, and then as I was sitting still in the holding pattern at 11 hours, um, waiting for the crosswinds to die down, uh, I had a fuel malfunction. Um, and uh, the uh, one, one of the interesting things on the U-2 uh, that, that a lot of people, you would think, you know, most aircraft have this, but it, it doesn't really have a real fuel system like you think of in most aircraft. So, um, you know, I would say a real act actual fuel gauge. Um, what they what they do is is uh, they top it up with with fuel, or they put out however much fuel they want for the mission, and then uh, they go along with a little dipstick that has marks on it, and they dip the wings in, in you know several different spots. They add up the amount of fuel in the jet, and they put that on a little totalizer in our cockpit. It shows us, say, you're starting with this amount of gas. Uh, you know, so, and, uh, and another thing makes it a little different is it's in gallons too. So most airplanes do in pounds. And so, you know, so going on a mission, it might be, you know, 2,500 gallons of gas put in the jet. Um, and then as you burn, uh, as the, the fuel flow transmitter, you know, going into the engine detects the amount of fuel that you've burned, uh, it just ticks fuel off of that. So it's not an actual true reading of how much fuel you have in the jet. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the wings are also divided in kind of there's a, the larger inner tank of the fuel tank and then a smaller uh, outboard tank uh, and everything is supposed to feed from the inboards first uh, and then uh, it will come from the outboards uh, after that and because I've been holding so long and because of where I was in on the atmosphere the atmos uh, atmospherics at the time were super cold colder than normal. Um, the fuel that was coming in from those outboards after I'd burned the inboard started to freeze up. So I started actually having indications that the engine was about to seize up from fuel loss of fuel flow. Uh, so it, you know, my decision was made for me. I, 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 had, I was basically where I was orbiting. I could go, I could either glide to my primary base or I could glide to a different base. Um, and, uh, you end up, uh, you know, from altitude, you, can, you know, glide you know over 150 miles so you get you have you have options um but so i decide okay you know i'm gonna i'm i guess my my decisions made for him for me i'm going to this other base um and uh, uh we actually one of the things we practice in our training is uh not only how to land it with the engine out um but uh, or with the engine in a possibly degraded state um uh, but uh, you also learn you, you practice what they call no voice landing. So you know you probably you see the videos of the yeah uh, chase car and the you know the, yeah. the chase car pilot you know which is another YouTube pilot who's talking you down he's giving you all the, all the calls stuff like that. And one of the things we practice when we're doing those those uh, emergency pattern uh, practice patterns is no voice landings. And uh, uh, you know we're, we still have the chase car driver. He just doesn't make any calls unless um, unless he asks you for safety. For safety and, uh, reasons. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, you know, and that's just so in case like this, you're going into this base, there's not a guy on the ground that's going to give you calls. Uh, and it was, and it was one o'clock in the morning as well. Uh, so it's at night, you know, and I'm, I'm basically spiraling down over a field. I, and fortunately, I never lost my engine. Um, it did continue to, uh, as I got a little bit lower, the, the, some of the fuel unfroze and, it, and it, I, my indications went back close to normal. Um, as I got down, but uh, I still treated it like an emergency situation and I went down and landed. Um, and then uh, it's, uh, you know, U2 requires a huge footprint of people to deal with it. Uh, and uh, uh, 
usually, you know, when, when we land at, uh, uh, normally on a, at a base or whatever, and we have the ground crew, we just stop the plane on the runway and they, they put, we put the pogos back in, uh, in the jet and then we can taxi it off like a normal plane. Uh, well here, I didn't, you know, I didn't have the pogos to put in and stuff like that. So, um, this, uh, this base had a high speed, uh, taxiway and I just, I was able to land it safely uh, and I just rolled out on the high speed taxiway and I came to a stop. Um, and what was funny is before this, there had been another mission, uh, up that day that was supposed to get down well before all the crossmen started, but he wasn't able to, and he had already diverted several hours before. And, uh, uh, we ended up parking two jets basically back to back on a, on a high speed taxiway. And, uh, you know, and once you're down to a certain speed, um, you know, if you're fairly well balanced with fuel in the wings, which is another thing, you actually have to balance it yourself based on just feel. feel. Uh, there's no indication of where the fuel is in the wings. Um, uh, but, you know, once you get down below 10 knots or so, you don't have the, the aerodynamic authority with the ailerons to keep the wings level. So eventually one of the wings is going to fall. Sometimes it'll happen before that if you're unbalanced. But uh, the, the previous pilot that had landed, diverted before me in there, uh, had, uh, uh, hit when he went to a stop or we finally came to a stop and he, you know, he didn't realize that one of the wings actually crushed one of the lights, uh, on the, uh, on the airfield. But, you know, that's the cost of doing business, I guess, you with, <laughs> with the U2 landing at night. <laughs> yeah, so, um, the, uh, so yeah, so it, it was interesting. They had to, uh, generate a team of maintenance guys that came up, um, to get me, uh, I, I got driven basically in my space suit uh, over to a supply building where they gave me just a, a, a blank flight suit, flight suit, didn't have any kind of rank or anything like that on me. And, uh, you know, the next day they flew up a, a maintenance crew with some other pilots and stuff that were going to fly the jets back. And they brought some of my clothes, you know, they went in my room and got some of my clothes for me. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, before then I was basically walking around in a, you know, blank flight suit. And, um, but, uh, yeah, it's definitely interesting when, when you have to divert a plane like that. We, we are receiving a lot of questions, Ro, so okay. I, I hope that I will be able to do my list of, of, yeah. of questions yeah. because I have many, but uh, let's, let's uh, take a, a few more uh, from, uh, from all those uh, who are watching the live. Uh, one is uh, from uh, uh, Gaetan who says is uh, whether there's uh, a specific uh, psychological support uh, for uh, uh, YouTube pilots. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the psychological part uh, uh, previously. Is there uh, uh, something specific that is done for YouTube pilots or? or um, um, you, you know, there's, there's nothing, uh, I would say there's no particular program, at least when I was in the program that uh, to deal with that kind of stuff other than the, the normal Air Force, uh, you know, psychological type uh, uh, support programs that, that they provide, you know, for everyone, including pilots and, okay. uh, and so forth. So, yeah, there, there wasn't anything, any, uh, you know, specific U2 support when I was in it. Okay. And there's another uh, interesting question uh, that is uh, uh, from Christian uh, with current satellites how did the YouTube manage to stay relevant? This is something I, that I would ask later, but uh, yeah. this is interesting. Oh no, yeah, no, it, it's a great question because it gets asked, you know, at every air show uh, I've ever done <laughs> ever, you know, um, and, uh, and, and it's definitely a good question. A lot of people want to know, because you think, you think obviously, you know, well, well, we have satellites, satellites are better, they're higher up, you know, uh, you know, why would the U2 still be around? There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you, know, you get into a very complex relationship with how, uh, how reconnaissance works in our country, you know, that, you know, there's, there's satellites are great and they're, they're a necessary part of any kind of intelligence gathering, uh, mechanism, but, you know, you, you basically, you have the layers, you know, if you think about, you know, the, what, you know, predators and reapers and stuff like that are doing out there where they're, you know, they're focusing, you know, I, I kind of, I would call it like looking through a soda straw, but they're, they're, you know, they are concentrating on a, on a very specific, you know, compound or something like that using an operation. Um, and, uh, and then you got, you got intelligence on the ground, you know, and you have, you know, small UAVs, you know, the army using and stuff like that. Um, you have this multi-layered approach to intelligence, you know, going all the way to the top and, and out of, out into outer space. 
And so the U2 fits into that nice, that kind of, uh, I would say, bridging the gap between what you call strategic intelligence um, uh, and tactical intelligence. So uh, the, uh, the U2 is able to go up into a spot and basically persist in an, in an area for quite a, quite a long time, you know, keeping an eye on, an, on a target uh, or, uh, you know, or collecting in a very specific area in a very specific way. Um, for you know things like satellites and stuff, they follow the rules of orbital uh, orbital mechanics, and yeah, you know, they might get a look at a place you know uh, two times a day or something like that. Um, and uh, like I said, it's very very important information. It's just you know when the battlefield commanders and you know, especially the the, uh, the the geographic commanders who are operating this region when they're looking at you know strategic kind of reconnaissance uh, on a specific area, you know they. Uh, they rely on the U2 and what it offers. And, and one of the big things that the U2's, uh, one of the reasons that it's remained so relevant is, um, you know, the, the airplane itself, it's, it's a modular design for the sensors. So um, you need a different type of sensor. You, you take the other one off, you put, put one on. Um, that means that you, you don't have to build a whole new airplane to have a completely new capability. Uh, and, you know, and even on, you know, the, some of the sensors we've been using forever, they get upgraded and they get, you know, new technology put onto them. And today it's flying technology that's state of the art, you know, and it uh, provides, you know, capabilities that it didn't have, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, 50 years ago, uh, it's all uh, new technology is put on. And really one of the, one of the, you know, I would say driving factors behind that. Uh, and, th and this is, this is, my opinion, I obviously don't speak for the Air Force or anything like, anything like that, but you know, the, <laughs> the, you know, the Air Force, I would say, you know, they wanted to get rid of the U-2 a long time ago. Uh, it was costing them money. They wanted to be able to use the money elsewhere. They wanted UAVs and, and whatnot to do it. And it, it was really, it was, you know, it, it was kind of the, the pilots, I would say, that kind of led, led the way on exploring new ways to use the U-2. Uh, and we would demonstrate it, uh, you know, in battle that, hey, we can be used in this way. We can be used in a more tactical way if we need to. We can be used in a more strategic way. There's different ways we can use these sensors than what the way that they're being used right now. Um, we had some really smart guys who went, uh, you know, took their staff jobs and went to the Pentagon and they basically advocated for the U-2. Uh, and, you know, because there were years where the U-2 got no, virtually no funding. We were just on life support, able to continue to exist. And, uh, you know, I think uh, some wanted us to kind of die out. And we, uh, we had some guys, uh, very smart guys who advocated uh, at some of the highest levels. And uh, so, you know, we had four star generals saying, you're not going to take my U2 away from me. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's too important to my job, too important, you know, to what, what I'm trying to do here. And, uh, uh, you know, and really now in the last year or two, you know, it's the first time in a long time. The U2 is now back on, you know, a funding track for new and, and more advanced technology. So, you know, I, as many people think the U2 is going to just fade out, I think it's it's it actually has a number of years to go before you're, uh, you're going to see it fully put to rest. Uh, thank you, Ross, for explaining this. this um, it's uh, among the most interesting things. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I think about uh, the most about uh, the U2 is that, um, as you mentioned, it's a modular system. Uh, it is able to accommodate a uh, lot of different payloads, a lot of different sensors. Some of those are quite evident on the airframe itself. The, Senior yeah. span and so on, so uh, senior span and so on, and so this is extremely interesting. But if you agree, I would like to start going inside the cockpit, sure. and I would like to show one of your uh, photograph. Um, uh, that was, you can also tell us something about this one, but let's start to see how uh, the the cockpit of the U two. Uh, has changed uh, because uh, some people may believe that, uh, 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 let's say, uh, an aircraft that has been around for uh, so many decades has uh, uh, 
uh, a previous generation cockpit, uh, whereas the uh, U2 has actually a, a pretty much a glass cockpit with a lot of displays and so on that yeah. you would expect from uh, next generation uh, airplanes. So let me show this photograph. Um, and I, I would like you to, to give us uh, a brief uh, uh, overview for dealing with, with what can be seen in this photograph about the cockpit of the uh, of the U2. Okay, um, yeah, so the, the U2, uh, it's, it's very much a mix of the old and the new. Uh, and, uh, and this, uh, when you're, uh, this is basically you're uh, stepping kind of down into the cockpit. Uh, they kind of make it easy when you're in the spacesuits, you don't have to climb, you know, make a huge step over or anything like that. So you, uh, you uh, step down into the cockpit and this is what you're gonna see. So in the, if you, for some of the old stuff and some people are kind of surprised, they see that it has a, a yoke uh, so you're flying with it with a fairly large yoke, um, uh, kind of like in a in a heavy airplane or something mm -hmm. like that, yeah. and uh, and that's mainly uh, because you you need you need a lot of kind of fine aileron authority, um, and uh, and you have to be able to uh, throw your weight into it literally uh, when you're flying this plane, uh, so that that yoke is connected obviously to the ailerons and also to the elevators in the back uh, and it's only connected with cable. So there's no hydraulic assist or anything like that. Um, so when you're fighting the winds with the jet, you, you're literally fighting the winds, you're feeling the winds fight, fight you back. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, you have that big yoke. So you, uh, you can actually apply the force that you need to get move this jet uh, where it needs to go. Uh, and we'll see some videos later of actually flying it down final and stuff. And, uh, um, but, uh, the, uh, so moving on, so you'll see above that yoke, there's uh, there's three glass screens, and those are yeah. multi-function displays. Uh, they can be, uh, you can put them in a, any configuration. There's a lot of different pages. Uh, this just shows, you know, three of them up. Uh, this would be kind of, a, I would say, the standard, you're one of the standard flight profiles or flight setups uh, you have in the center. You have a kind of a standard, uh, you, you call it, you know, our primary flight display. Uh, or PFD. So you have your, you know, obviously your uh, uh, attitude bank information, and then a uh, you have a horizontal situation indicator. Um, and you can obviously put up different uh, different kind of navigational aids, whether you're using your uh, your INU to navigate, uh, TACAN, um, or whatever, uh, you know, ILS. You can pull all that information up on the PFD. Uh, down into the right of that, you'll see the one with all the the gauges. Yeah. Uh, that is the systems page, and uh, that you know along the top it has your uh, your engine speed information. Obviously, there's just one engine, so that uh, one of those is showing your uh, uh, the uh, uh, the N1, and then the other the N2, and then the temperature coming out. So we actually would fly using our all of our power settings were based off the N2 power settings. Uh, so basically, the turbine speed of the engine and uh, the uh, and part of that's because they used to not have an in one indication back in the previous version so all the all the <laughs> the manuals and everything when you're learning you know what kind of like power setting you're going to use to fly you know level configured uh you know all that's based off the n2 which is that middle uh, of the gauges uh, among those three gauges uh, there uh, below that you're going to have your uh uh, you know, oil, hydraulic information, and then uh, fuel stuff at the bottom. And like I said, it's kind of, it's just a, uh, uh, here's our, here's our guess at how much fuel you actually have in the jet. Uh, there's a few, there are a few things, I'm not going to get into the specific, a few ways that you can tell in the flight of when you're actually at a certain fuel level, which can give you an indication. That's what happened to me in that emergency. I, I got an indication that I was not feeding enough fuel to the engine. And that's the kind of stuff that would show up down there. And then, you uh, you know have other information about how much oxygen you have and so forth, uh, cabin pressure and all that. So all that's going to be on there. Um, that left MFD, uh, that one up now has uh, the uh, indications and warnings page, basically of, uh, showing the things. You know that uh, that obviously red is bad, yellow is uh, okay. You know blue is just kind of more information. Uh, kind of a standard color scheme, at least for uh, a lot of aircraft uh, to use. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, beside the 
the PFD, uh, it's kind of hard to, the glare shield hides a little bit. There's actually a standby attitude indicator on the mm -hmm. right of that. And uh, you just see the, the very the bottom of it there. Um, that That's actually a fully internal piece. So if you, even if you lost everything else, you should still have that um, that going working for you. Uh, and then the other, the, they call it upfront display to the left of the PFD is just where you select your frequencies and so forth. Uh, and you're able to punch all that stuff in. Um, it, you can't see in this photo down into the left. That's where a throttle is, just one throttle. And uh, that uh, the engine that it's powering, it's a GE F118 uh, turbofan engine. And uh, at full thrust, it's going to put out about 17,000 pounds of thrust. And it's uh, not afterburning, uh, but still, that's, that's the amount of thrust even without the afterburner. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, when, when you see the U-2 and its climb rate and everything, is uh, in particular, when you see a training aircraft, you know, a training aircraft may only be a little bit over 20,000 pounds. Um, and so you get, you know, 17,000 pounds of thrust behind you. Uh, plus these huge wings generate lift, you get an incredible you know, climb rate out of that. Um, the, uh, uh, sorry, you can't really see any other, the, in front of that throttle, there's, uh, there's switches for um, raising your gear. And then you have some other switches like your flaps and things on that left side as well. Um, uh, the, one question, uh, Russ. Yeah, even, yeah. even though uh, it is not visible uh, in, this, uh, in this image, um, uh, uh, as far as I remember, there's been uh, a, a recent addition to the uh, U2 fleet. It is the, the use of uh, iPads. I mean, uh, uh, some yes. iPads have found their way uh, <laughs> to the cockpit. Uh, these uh, are used uh, as a backup uh, navigation they, tool, uh, or, or they are, or do you use uh, for uh, different reasons uh, for uh, um, so for you, entertainment during long missions? Well, you, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they could, and I, you know, I, I, I will neither confirm nor deny that that I might have <laughs> used. Uh, devices such as that for entertainment in the past. But um, the uh, the iPads actually in my, in my last year with U2, we actually uh, were officially given iPads. And um, they uh, uh, started out as mainly an aid for the T38, but have also been turned into an aid to be, be used in the U2. Um, and uh, it's uh, it, it is actually very helpful um, you would have have things like four flight in there, um, and uh, not not as much on a uh, on a mission, but you know on some of these flights when you're ferrying a jet, and uh, so for know, some controller, classified mission. Yeah, yeah, at unclass, you're you're ferrying a jet somewhere, and, and sometimes controllers, even though you're you know seventy thousand feet, want you to fly a certain route or something like that for whatever reason, and our our internal navigation system there, you know, the, the nav system that, that the INU works off of internally, it's not a true flight management system. It doesn't have, I can't punch in, you know, to go to this nav aid or fly this airway in there. Um, and uh, it's all just waypoints that are built externally on a, on a computer by our, our mission planners before a mission. So um, you either have to build the waypoint yourself or try to navigate with off needles. Um, uh, or you can look at four flight on your your uh, iPad, uh, and and you know and that's really just just the start of the functioning of the iPad, and and I, uh, uh, it's it's uh, you know there there we actually have some pretty smart guys too that have actually built their own apps that can be used on missions and things that that help out in certain ways, you know. So um, you know, whereas you know that we do have a. Um, you know, the function of basically in the jet, if say there would start to be an, an issue, I could just say, yeah, I want you to go direct to this field or whatever, find the nearest one. You know, we've had guys who have built it to be a lot more robust on the iPad where it can actually help you out with that decision, you know, based on runway length and stuff like that. Uh, and it would still work, be working even if say all your electrics quit or the engine quit. Um, so, uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of functions um, and like I said, so, you know, they, they, they might have been used at some point in time for entertainment as well. But. Yeah. Uh, 
I think that um, the, you also uh, have, I mean, you, uh, I, I mean, the U2 air crews have, have also received a, a Garmin uh, smartwatch, uh, but uh, uh, I, this can not be used on the usual, I, I see you can uh, use it on the standard flight suit, not on the, on the one, the pressurized uh, that you use for uh, uh, mission, uh, for, at uh, 70,000 feet, is that right? Well, you could actually, and I never did this, but uh, some guys would put some Velcro on it and, and on our spacesuit sleeve, there is a, a Velcro spot where you can Velcro okay. a watch okay. on. Uh, it's, it's, it was used more in the past, you know, when uh, guys would, you know, it didn't, the jet didn't have as good a timing uh, and internal GPS and so forth. Um, but uh, I, I never did that. I did, I did, uh, often have it with me, uh, kind of in, in we, we, most of us, we, we carry a bag called it a Yobo bag, um, that, uh, uh, carried all of our, whatever kind of gadgets, you know, plus it, we'd have our, our checklists and things like that, paper copies of, uh, uh, our condensed mm -hmm. checklists and things like that. Um, and, uh, that was one of the items I, you know, I would have in there. Um, you know, other guys would have things like, uh, uh, had a little bendy, um, a, uh, a little claw that you could get out and you could be with a plunger thing that you could pick stuff off the floor with, you know, say drop a pencil or whatever. Um, so I always had something like that. I usually had a, had a leather leatherman with me cause sometimes knobs would come off in the jets, things like that. So, uh, or at one time I had one, a very important one get stuck in position. I'd use a leatherman to actually maneuver the, 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 the knob in the jet. Um, but, uh, um, so, yeah, so you usually had uh, some of your own little personal gadgets like that. And uh, there are one last question about, uh, I mean, these devices that can be found in the cockpit yeah. of the U2 that is kind of uh, interesting. Is uh, You also brought with you the Stratus uh, ADS-B receivers. Mm -hmm. uh, because yes. I'm asking this, um, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, those were used uh, uh, as a backup uh, or during ferry flights, not for classified mission, for uh, operational mission. Is that right? Or you could use... Uh, uh, the, also... Well, so I, I would say I never used it on a classified mission, of course. I, I didn't, I never flew any missions since we got all that, that uh, those fancy gadgets. Um, okay. The, uh, that was one of the security concerns. And I, I, I'm, I'm honestly, I don't, I'm not sure of the answer right now on what they're doing okay. that uh, with those on, you know, say on a classified mission. Um, but uh, the main thing is that Stratus, it was our main, the, the, the iPads we got did not have the in, uh, internal GPS. So that was our main source of GPS that was connected to the iPad. Um, and, and you get the ADSB information as well, which was, you know, it was, it was more useful in the T38, um, you know, to be able to look and see what traffic's around you and stuff like that. But, you know, there usually wasn't a lot of traffic around you in the U2 um, <laughs> that you had to worry about. Even though I have uh, recently uh, read somewhere that there are the Google loons, the, the balloons, uh, that yeah. maybe uh, we, we had a pilot who saw one one time. I, I never saw oh. one, but uh, it was something that we actually had, uh, uh, was supposed to be part of our our pre flight planning when we'd show up and we'd we'd get a current map of where the Google loons were. Okay. Uh, okay. So just because they they did operate in the same you know around the same altitude bands that we might be in, so you know it could could be a factor out there. And uh, uh, dealing with the ADSB. Uh, my question is uh, just because uh, you can uh, track uh, uh, on the flight tracking websites. Uh, these are pretty famous, uh, and I'm, yeah. I'm a lover of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've <laughs> like, seen, I've uh, seen your stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. know that I always follow uh, traffic on ADSB Exchange, uh, Plan Radar, and so on. Uh, I assume, but let's let's see. Uh, let's uh, ask the question. I assume the the question, the answer is yes. But uh, uh, were you aware? And generally speaking, are uh, you two pilots aware that uh, part, uh, at least part of their flight of their mission, uh, can be tracked online using public public domain stuff yeah. like a browser and a public yeah. uh, uh, website? Uh, this is something that. Uh, uh, we use uh, even journalists use uh, to track yeah. and 
see what what is happening all around the world. And today, for instance, yeah. I I tracked uh, a U2 uh, that was landing in um, Akrotiri in Crete. Uh, so yeah. uh, this is something that uh, is still relevant in some way. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I would say that we. Um, when we're dealing with air traffic control, um, in the in the general sense, uh, as as a normal airplane, we're we're going to be squawking like normal, um, and we, we definitely know that we can be tracked as we're squawking. Um, it's actually you know if if we're going into an operating area or mission area where we don't want to be tracked, that's going to be that's going to be on our checklist to yeah. make sure that we're not going to be, uh, you know, or we're going to be emitting as as least that we uh, possibly can. And uh, hopefully not be tracked that way. I'm sure mistakes have happened, and you know someone has missed that or something like that. <laughs> but uh, uh, but in general, you know, we definitely know that uh, we can we can be tracked. And I think it was actually one of our pilots a couple of years ago that did. Uh, uh, I think he put in his mode S that they uh, it was like the designator for the Starship Enterprise or something like that. It was he was flying <laughs> it, so you know that that made a little, a little rounds on on the news as well when that happened. So because uh, he knew okay. it was going to be tracked, you know, but. But in general, yeah, I'd say um, we we're aware of, of when we're when we're actually emitting uh, and when we're not. So. Okay, uh, we have you have already uh, mentioned uh, how difficult can be to land a U two. I have a video that you uh, filmed, uh, and yep. if you agree, uh, we will show. Uh, let's see if this uh, works because it's not easy. First of all. <laughs> Yeah, works from if, if we can manage uh, to make it work, uh, and uh, I'll show the last uh, from the let's say the final to the landing, and then I will let you comment uh, so okay. that we can we can talk about uh, the landing phase. Uh, you mentioned the chase car, uh, that is yeah. one of the most interesting thing about uh, the YouTube. But I think that uh, the video. Uh, gives an idea. Uh, this is a, a, this would be a 360 video. I'm not sure you, I will be able to show uh, the uh, stereoscopic vision of the 360 degree yeah. video, but it, it, we it didn't seem to work before. But we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. Okay. Let Let's see. Let me show uh, this one. Um, uh, okay. Let me do this way. Okay. Let's see if the last few seconds can be seen. This looks like near the beginning of the pattern. Yes, it has started from the beginning. It was, it didn't, there was no. I think there's there's no way to to make it work uh, uh, the way that we would like. So let me see if I can select the last few seconds. You are already on the ground here. It doesn't make me start from here. So uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to uh, to show these. Uh, uh, it's I, I think that is uh, from your point of view stuck uh, to the first image, uh, even though I'm watching it uh, oh, yeah. uh, as it progresses. So anyway, uh, let me show this you again. Um, can you explain uh, uh, why and uh, it is so difficult to land this plane that you have already explained uh, and uh, um, the difference uh, between uh, landing the aircraft uh, with or without uh, the flaps because it changes a bit the way that you, you fly uh, the Dragon Lady? Yeah. Um, the, uh, so going back, to, and this goes back to the original design uh, with Kelly Johnson, Skunk Works, uh, Lockheed. Um, the uh, they wanted to save as much weight as they could. So they wanted the jet to be able to get as high as they could. So when they built the this original design, um, you know they put these huge huge glider wings, basically uh, like on an uh, F-104 fuselage, and um, the uh, to save weight, they gave it only one center gear. 
which is basically right around the, the center uh, uh, of gravity of the jet, uh, or a little bit in front of that, and then a tail wheel in the back. So it's one of the last tail draggers that we have um, flying, at least in the military. And uh, so, so you're, you're basically, you're dealing with landing on two gears. So one, you know, again, one in the center, one in the tail, and they're set up like a bicycle. Um, so these wings generate so much lift um, that they're not, they don't let the plane land unless you actually stall the jet to land it. So most planes you, you have a, you know, either power on landing or you, you, uh, you fly down to, you know, touchdown speed, but it's still, it's nowhere near your stall speed. You're not, a, you know, you fly on a passenger jet, you're never about to stall the jet uh, or you come anywhere close to it, not within 20 or 30 knots of stalling. Um, and the U-2, it doesn't land unless you do stall it. So, um, and you have to do that above the ground. Um, and so your goal with the jet, you're gonna, you're gonna fly down, um, you try to cross the runway threshold about 10 feet or so. And when the chase car driver is giving you calls, he's giving you calls off that main gear. Um, while he's also watching the tailwheel during all this. So he, he's looking at the main gear and he's gonna give altitude calls in feet uh, starting usually at 10 and uh, uh, he'll count you down 10, 8, 6, 5, 4. You know, as you're transitioning in that, that five foot range or so, you're trying to kind of round out the jet, um, kind of like starting the flare in a normal jet. Um, and you're trying to, trying to arrive right at two feet above the ground. And then it's your job to keep it at two feet. Because um, as the jet the jet starts slowing down, it starts getting closer and closer to its stall speed. It actually takes more and more force from the yoke. You pull them back. So you're sitting there, you're having to pull back on the yoke continuously to keep the jet at two feet. And while you're doing that, the tail is actually dropping down. So it starts up, the tail's kind of up. And then as you, it gets level, as you slow down, and then before it stalls, the tail it is, should be the first thing that touches the runway. Um, and that's right about the stall point. And so, um, ideally you're hearing, you know, 10, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 2, 2. And by that point, hopefully, you know, on a normal landing, the, uh, you, you're at about the stall speed and you actually, once it stalls, you pull the yoke all the way, all the way to your chest. So you're landing with the yoke all the way to your chest. Um, while, while you're doing all this, uh, you also, since you have a bicycle, any kind of crosswind is you're going to have the, like I said, that it's going to be knocking the tail out of center. So you got to use rudder to bring it back. Uh, so you have to keep the jet straight. You're sitting there, the winds are doing other things. You're, you have to keep the jet straight. Uh, as the uh, chase car driver, uh, who again is another U2 guy, um, the, uh, he's going to, if, if, if he needs to give you calls to straighten out the jet, he's going to say something like right rudder, left rudder, more right rudder. Um, as he's giving you the altitude call. So he's got to be pretty quick uh, with his tongue uh, speaking there. Um, uh, and then, you know, aerodynamically, once you, as soon as you stop crabbing into the wind, you straighten it out. Now the wind's going to start making you drift across the runway. Um, and now you have to, while you have that yoke all the way kind of close to your chest and you're flying like that, you got to uh, kind of kill that drift, you know, uh, with the ailerons. Uh, so you're working your feet, you're working the, the pitch and the, the ailerons all the way throughout the landing. Obviously, you don't want to do too much in the aileron because those wings, you know, they stick out over 50 feet in each direction from you. It's a 105 foot wingspan uh, total. Uh, so you're, uh, you're having to do all that. Again, touch down the tail wheel, you know, uh, and ideally you're uh, uh, touching down tail wheel first. No crab, no drift on center line. Um, and again, unlike most planes, once you're on the ground, it, you're not, you haven't stopped flying the plane. Um, the, uh, uh, a lot of guys, uh, a lot of times the, uh, some of our, uh, aircraft that have gone off runways for crosswinds and things like that, um, made the landing and then, you know, somehow either a gust of wind or they kind of stopped flying the controls and suddenly that, uh, that tail kicks out and now you're basically either kind of going off the runway or doing a kind of a ground loop. So, um, so you're, you're fully in control, uh, even after landing and, 
in order to have any kind of directional control or steering control, which the use the tail wheel to steer, um, the uh, you have to have full weight on the tail, and that means that while you're while you're going down the runway, you still have to have that that yoke all the way in your chest. So you're you're basically going down the <laughs> runway like this, yoking you know fully on. Um, you know, if you're coming to a full stop, you're uh, um, you know you just try to gently bring it to a stop while also keeping the wings level as much as you can. Um, the, uh, the wing tips have, they have a little, uh, skid plates on them. That's a, it's like a titanium alloy, um, that is put on the bottom of the wing tips. Uh, so you could, if you had to at high speed, you could hit the wing tip without actually damaging, damaging the jet. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, that's actually one of our kind of emergency procedures in a crosswind. If a crosswind is taking you off the runway, you can slam down the other wing to hopefully keep you on the runway. Um, but, uh, the, uh, I, you know, you have that, you know, but, uh, you, you, ideally you'd like to be almost to a full stop before a wing tip hits on the ground. And, uh, the, uh, you know, when we're doing practice patterns, we actually are doing touch and go. So you're having to do the whole, you know, the whole landing process, get it under control. And then you're having to reconfigure the flaps and everything while you're still roll, rolling down the runway, keeping the wing tips up, not touching uh, the ground, uh, getting everything cleaned up. And then you push the power back up and go. Um, and I would say that's probably when, uh, when I did the interview flights for, uh, prospective U2 pilots, uh, I did that the last four years of my career. And, uh, the, uh, that was one of the hardest parts for them is, you know, not just the landing, but, um, you know, on their first, first flight, they're just going down the runway. They're just going tap, 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 you know, hitting the wingtips, uh, as they go down the runway and the, 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 the chase car pilot, which we call the mobile. He's sitting back there going, raise your right, raise your left, raise your right, you know, raise your light, you know, bring your yoke aft. And so it's a, it, it's this kind of this muscle memory training that you get really, you get good at it after a while um, where, um, you know, you might detect the, the left wing is dropping a little bit and you, uh, you give a full aileron to the right, just a jab, you know, we call it a jab. So you jab it to the right, jab it to the left, you know, and uh, you, uh, you know, and, and, the, uh, whenever you see, if you ever see a U2, like from the outside, it's coming down nice and smooth down final. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like it's right on track and it's right on speed and everything like that. The U2 pot inside is working his ass off. He is, he is, you know, even, even in the air, he's given full, full deflection left, full deflection, right. Full, you know, and working the rudders to make it look smooth. And, you know, if you ever see one and, and we, I have some, uh, I have some uh, footage, I think, on, on that website of some guys during their interviews. That's where the best footage comes from, is from the interview flights. And, uh, yeah, and you see this plane coming down final, and he's just doing this and this, and, you know. And, like, I'm like inside, that that guy is just sitting there frozen like this. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And because uh, and you 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 have to – it really it's, – it's like a muscle memory you have to develop that you um, – you know, and, and part of the part of the problem with the U2 that makes it so difficult as well is you have these you have 20 feet, 20 foot of aileron on each each side. So the last 20 feet of the wing is aileron. Uh, it gives you a huge amount of aileron authority. You know, like I said, all the way down to about 10 knots, you can still fly the wings. Um, but the uh, um, with that comes a penalty in the in adverse yaw. And that's something, you know, the people that fly in smaller craft or plenty aware of, of what adverse yaw is, but the U2 really pronounces it. So every time, you know, if you need to raise the left wing um, to roll to the right, that by shifting that aileron down on the left-hand side, and puts a huge amount of drag on that wing. So it might raise it, but it's also gonna pull that back. Okay. And that's that adverse yaw. So they, uh, you know, so if you turn, roll to the right, you're gonna pull the nose to the left and so forth. And uh, so you have to get your feet have to be on the pedals. You have to be ready every time you add an aileron input, you add a rudder input too. And it, and it has to be pretty pronounced as well. And, and that's kind of, that's kind of one of the challenges when we're doing the interview is, uh, it, and I'm surprised that after three flights, guys, uh, the guys that we end up hiring, they, they at least have, you know, some of that muscle memory down where they've gone from being the, the wallowing down final mm -hmm. to a nice looking pretty nice and steady. And, uh, you know, and that's all part of that, like that learning curve I was talking about that, um, you know, it, it's 
a lot of times the guys that are, when they're doing that, they're like, there's really not even any point trying to land the jet because it's going to turn into a disaster anyway. So it's, you know, it's kind of that building process, you know, if we can get the whole pattern down, you know, if, if I can get them to 10 feet on speed um, and uh, not wallowing down final, now we can work on the landing. And because uh, because that's still where the, the hardest part comes in at the end. And uh, we're talking about the um, landing phase that is one of the, the most dangerous, let's say, uh, part of the flight. But uh, during a mission uh, with the U-2, there are uh, other things that uh, uh, you have to take into consideration. Uh, I mean, uh, there's uh, other things that uh, 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 can happen uh, during a mission. I mean, turbulence, uh, uh, jet streams, uh, uh, are these or even uh, uh, mission changes, uh, working your task and so on? Um, so landing aside, uh, yeah. which are the most, uh, let's say, the pain points of a YouTube pilot, uh, even <laughs> though he's flying so high, uh, so above uh, uh, most of the threats uh, that uh, uh, an aircraft, a combat aircraft, uh, uh, may encounter during a mission, uh, which are your the things that yeah. you have to consider during during the mission. <laughs> so you know, so even before the mission, I would say one of the greatest threats uh, to the pilot is themselves and uh, them being physiologically ready for this flight. And it, and all you know, that all goes back to um, the the day prior. You have to you have to eat right. You have to you have to know your body, and you get to know your body pretty well. Um, you know, but you're, you're obviously, you're strapped into an ejection seat for, you know, eight, 10, you know, possibly 12 hours. Uh, and you, you are you know, you've been sitting in that spacesuit an hour longer than that because you're in the spacesuit an hour prior to takeoff, um, breathing oxygen. So, uh, so you have to plan on a day where you're, you're in this space. So you can't get up, you can't do anything. Um, and, uh, you know, while you while you can relieve yourself, uh, number one, uh, you know, there's there's obviously no um, no having to go. Number two, out there, so um, the uh, you have to eat right, um, and you have to know that when you wake up that day, uh, that you're going to be able to sit into a spacesuit, you know, for 12, 13 hours if you had to, and um, you know, because that that has actually canceled missions before, ruined missions. Um, the uh, you know, one of the main jobs of the chase car pilot is that he's usually the backup pilot too. So I've had days where I've come in like, you know what, my stomach is not agreeing with me today. Uh, I don't think I should get into a spacesuit. And you know, that's their their job to basically be the one. That, okay, I'll I'll jump in. You know, and I've been on both both sides of that coin before. So, um, the uh, so you know that's probably one of the biggest threats. Are are you going to be up for a mission like this um, while you're on the mission? You know. You, uh, High altitude turbulence is, is definitely a threat. Um, we have lost aircraft to that before. Uh, oh. It's been many years, but um, mm -hmm. the uh, um, that is something that uh, if you encounter, you know, you need to try to get out of. You got to try to find a way uh, to deal with it. And a lot of that, you know, when you're in the stratosphere, uh, you're dealing with such a small amount of air uh, in general. Um, the uh, small temperature changes in the air, you got small pockets of uh, temperature deviation and stuff like that can cause huge mock swings uh, in there. And sometimes the jet, you know, will try to compensate for that. It might, you know, I, I've been at times where suddenly the jet is pitching up, you know, 15, 20 degrees nose high, you know, and I'm at 65,000 feet and, uh, and I'm slowing down uh, because of the, the, whatever the air, you know, pocket I'm going through. And, uh, Sometimes autopilot, you know, it'll, you'll go into some of these bumpy areas and then the autopilot just decides, you know, what, I can't handle it. You got it. And, uh, you know, it'll 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 shock you back into reality that you're you're <laughs> flying this jet. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it, it, it sound we call it the French fire brigade when that that horn goes off. But, yeah, it's a, a pretty noticeable horn uh, when the autopilot decides to uh, just uh, disengage on its own. And, uh, you know, you got to you got to hand fly and get it back back down uh, or get it under control, which again, we're trained to do. We're trained to hand fly the jet. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the mission stuff, a lot of the stuff has to be very precise. And some of the, some of these sensors require you to be on an exact altitude, exact, exact place, you know? So, you know, a lot of times where, yeah, I can, I can fly the jet, hand fly it at altitude. 
Um, I'm not going to try to fly a mission that way normally, um, depending on the mission. But um, it, it also, you know, if you had to, if you're having a hand fly, you know, you're not going to fly 12 hours like that. So you're going to try to get the jet back. Um, so, yeah, so there's threats from that. Um, you always have to be aware of your surroundings and you're in a single engine jet. You always have to be ready uh, in case that one engine quits for whatever reason. Uh, you have to know where you're going to go. Uh, and that uh, kind of going back to the iPad thing, usually my main, you know, I didn't really care to be able to have to navigate the mission on that. My main thing with that is I always had it, uh, you know, or we, we used to use Gar when it, most of my mission stuff, we were flying with like a Garmin 296, uh, kind of rubber banded to the one of our mirrors up on the side. Um, but still with that, I, you know, I would always have uh, whatever my main divert base was uh, should the engine quit and I'd have it already punched in direct to that place. So uh, if, you know, cause when I lose the engine, I'm also going to lose all that cool glass screen in front of me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be flying off that one little bitty standby indicator up there in the top right uh, corner. Uh, and then I'll be navigating off of that Garmin or that, you know, now the iPad. Um, and uh, uh, you know, so you have to uh, still do all the normal pilot stuff where, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm checking, I'm checking the weather at, at these bases that I might have to go into, uh, you know, cause I, if there's a place where the crosswinds are 25 knots and I have a choice between that and another place with it right down the runway, I obviously want to choose the place, uh, with the good winds. And, uh, so, so you're, you're, you're having to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, you know, changes to the mission that could always come up. Uh, a lot of times, especially when I was flying in Afghanistan, we, we did a lot of support. Uh, for people on the ground. And, uh, and I, I was there through some pretty active phases of fighting there. And there were plenty of times where we, we were helping directly with people on the ground. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I have already planned it out, you know, but I know they're going to ask uh, if, you know, how long can you stay here? And because uh, our base was not anywhere near that area, it was a two and a half hour drive back home, I would say. So, I'd have to calculate out my gas based off of my guesstimate of how much gas I actually have in the jet and uh, say, okay, yeah, I can stay an extra hour and a half or whatever. Um, you know, but you had to, uh, had to be ready to kind of make those kind of calls on the fly. Um, but a lot of times just, you know, good, good mission planning, knowing, even if you didn't know exactly what you were going to do the next day, you had a pretty good idea. Uh, you knew the area, you knew the rules of engagement in that area. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, uh, you knew kind of who you were going to be looking at and how you could possibly end up helping as well. Okay, if you agree, Ross, before we start with yeah. the photography part, because that is uh, extremely interesting uh, for me and for the rest of the audience, uh, I will check uh, for the uh, all the questions that we have received, that you have received. I will okay. ask you uh to be as brief as possible in responding yeah, sure. so that yeah. we have to... <laughs> yeah, so, I uh, let's see uh the first one from saint is that uh is about uh, what one development would you have liked uh, to have uh, uh, during your time with the youtube to make life easier as a driver if uh, any i think um uh, actually one thing they had already developed and then we lost funding for it um was a uh electro optical view site um okay. They, uh, uh, they used to have on, before they put in the glass, they used to have a, a, a called a drift site or view site where you could look at the ground. They'd already developed a camera that could be used by me in the cockpit to look at the ground and like pinpoint locations. Um, I, I always, you know, there were a lot of times on missions that I flew where that would have come in uh, really useful. Um, and if, if, if we weren't gonna have that, I really wish we would have gotten a good fuel system in the jet, like I mentioned, so beat that to death, but. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I will go to another mission because uh, to another question because it is interesting yeah. dealing with what we you, you were talking about, uh, and uh, it's from Richard. Do you have control of the mission sensor cameras or they are operated uh, automatically or via ground links uh, in the same way as UAVs? Uh, uh, you you manage all your yeah. sensor. Something is pre-programmed and goes. Uh, do you have just to fly a specific path, a specific <laughs> altitude what can you say about this, yeah. this is i would say yes to, yes to all but the uh, <laughs> so we <laughs> we we have we have very little control over what the actual sense like some most of the the electronic sensors what is actually taking a shot of uh you know, and where where it's looking um but you know a lot of times this it, 
this stuff's being fed, fed through a data link and there might be a hundred people on the end of that data link, not all in the same place, but just distributed around. Um, and uh, we're usually dealing with one mission controller who's on the ground. They're the main intelligence kind of uh, uh, officer on this and they're kind of, and they're the main one I'm working with for uh, if, if their mission changes, um, you know, but um, there are times with, let's say, you know, where I'm working with a, a electro optical uh, infrared sensor and I know that, you know, they're, they're taking a shot over here. They're trying to look for this compound in this mountains or, or whatever. And, uh, but I can see that there's a cloud right there in the way it's like, Hey, you know, let's swing around, let's get that from the South or whatever. And, um, okay. I think we'll be able to get a better shot of it, you know? So the, there was that kind of interaction. Um, there was a lot of stuff, you know, when I, like I said, when I was working with people on the ground, um, in Afghanistan where there was kind of a two way street of information where sometimes I'm getting information from them that I can feed to got my guys in the back, you know, to, Hey, you need to be concentrated on this. You know, but then there were times too where I'd wake up a guy in the middle of the night, going, "Hey, there's, there's, you know, just to let you know, you're, there's people, you know, a kilometer away from you, closing in on you or whatever, looking for an ambush um, or an attack." So it, it's, uh, there, there, it was a uh, when it was all working together as a great system of, you know, uh, and 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 to be honest, most of the time, like these sensors, you know, especially like a radar sensor, it produces an image that means absolutely nothing to me um but it means something to an analyst that spent years <laughs> trained how to look at that image you know and, yeah and 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 you know so they can they can glean in a huge amount of inf information from that where to me you know it, it looks like a sneeze or something so um you know it it, it was a it was a good it was a good relationship uh, when it, when we were flying these missions and everything was working good there's another question about missions now uh, and the question comes from stefan who asks uh, uh if you have flown both in the Middle East uh, theater uh, and the Far East, uh, uh, and if so, I don't know if you can answer this question, uh, yeah. if the mission differ a lot uh, between uh, one another or mostly similar ones and so on. Um, I, I would say that uh, there, uh, yes, so I'll have flown in all the, all the like, uh, locations. Um, okay. And yes, they, they would differ. Um, but you know, there might be missions in the same area where you might fly a mission one day and fly a completely different type of mission a couple of days later. Um, and it, it all kind of depends on what what we're tasked to get uh, for the the geographic and regional commands there uh, and, uh, you know, what what they're looking for. Um, and, you know, and the missions have changed, you know, that there it's been years since I've been in, over at Osan and uh, you know, I think we, we, you probably saw in the news the other day, I don't know if you saw it, the, about the the, uh, the Chinese were a little bit upset about a U2. Um, yeah. That's something, you know, that's something I never got to do when I, I was there before. But, um, you know, so so we uh, we definitely adapt what we're doing, you know, not just the sensors, but what, how we're using them and what theaters we're using them uh, for. Where were you ever fired at uh, by <laughs> someone, if you can answer this question? Not confirmed, you know, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I had one unusual instance, I, and I'm not sure what it. Let's what just it, say I, I didn't. I wasn't. I wasn't sure what happened. So okay, okay, I, okay. Yeah, uh, it, that's that's interesting. Thank yeah. you. And um, there's another question: uh, uh, Does the pilot get uh, pure uh, O2? Uh, have there been uh, hypoxia issues uh, like fighter jets? Uh, so uh, not not hypoxia issues, but we 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 yes we do get 100% oxygen, and we're actually breathing 100% oxygen. Um, the, the rules have changed a little bit about it. For most of my time flying, you were in the suit an hour prior, breathing 100% oxygen, and uh, the main reason that you breathe 100% oxygen is to purge the nitrogen from your blood. You know, so, so right now most of the air, most of what we're breathing in is nitrogen, so you have a lot of uh, microscopic nitrogen in your blood. Um, it's not an issue unless you go you were to uh, raise you know rise through the atmosphere very quickly and go into higher altitude um, where those bubbles then expand just like from a scuba diver um, they get it for a slightly different reason you know they're they're sucking in an excess amount of nitrogen when they're down you know 100 feet under the water um, and then those bubbles the same thing though those bubbles expand as they rise up too quickly in the water um, youtube pilot had to, you have to worry about those bubbles expanding uh, and, you know, it causes the same symptoms of the bends that uh, a scuba diver would get, 
Um, and I won't go into the full story now, but I did get decompression sickness one time. Uh, and it, it was on a, it was on a full mission and I was about as far away from a, a suitable spot to land as I could possibly be. Um, so, uh, it was, uh, it, it was pretty, you know, it, it was kind of scary. I'd say probably one of the more challenging and scary flights I, I ever had. Um, but that, I'd say that, that was the main like physiological concern going up there. Um, and, uh was getting the, getting the bends. And that's just because even if you breathe an hour of hundred percent oxygen before you take off, you know, you've purged out about 90% of the nitrogen in your body, but you still have some and you can't ever get rid of all of it. Um, but you know, it's something that, that NASA worries about too. And when astronauts are going out for a spacewalk, they have to pre breathe out oxygen and so forth. Cause they're in about almost the exact same physiological condition conditions sitting in their spacesuit, you know, in orbit, you know, at least pressure wise and the air that they're breathing. Uh, as the U2 pilot is sitting at 70,000 feet. Okay, um, there's another question from Polo, who is a, a glider pilot, who asks uh, the, the glide <laughs> ratio and the best glide speed for the U2. Um, the uh, glide ratio, I would say, um, given in, in miles, it was about three to one for a thousand feet, so three miles per thousand feet. Um, the uh, uh, it was at about an 18 to one, I guess, glide ratio. The, um, uh, as far as, uh, best glide speed and I'm trying to remember now, yeah. but based on the weight, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was some that, you know, on a normal training jet, it's going to be around like 105 knots or so, uh, best glide speed. Um, so, um, we would, uh, we transitioned it, you know, there's a, we had, we had several different speeds we worked with, you know, and it was anywhere from 90 to 105 knots or so generally that we're going to use if, if we lost the engine. Okay. And uh, there's another question from Stefano, but I think that you have already responded about the risk of ground loop. Uh, so this is something that you have already covered. Uh, I will uh, skip this uh, uh, and go to a question from uh, uh, Alan. Uh, who ask uh, uh, basically if there's a difference uh, in flying uh, uh, a clean uh, U2 versus <laughs> flying uh, one with the dorsal uh, uh, antenna or uh, any sensor protruding uh, from the from the yeah. fuselage. Um, the uh, uh, it was it was about the same. Uh, I, would, I would say the fuel wasn't uh, wasn't hugely different. It was the bigger thing was just the heavier weight. Uh, meant that it performed a little bit differently in the landing. Uh, of course, our la our speeds would be a little bit higher with the heavier weight from uh, the, you know, sensors and equipment and stuff like that on it, including the the the, uh, the data link on the back there. Um, so the uh, it, it was something that you you got used to fairly uh, you got fairly used to, but it was in general it was really all the, the extra weight made it come down a little bit quicker. Um, you had to watch from banging it on the on the runway. You know, because, you know, if you go down and you you don't stop the jet, you know, and you just go down and hit the runway, the jet's going to bounce and the wings are going to flex and uh, all kinds of bad things happen from there generally. Um, and uh, so that that's something you had to be definitely be a little bit more careful of when you had all that extra equipment on there. Okay, thank you. And uh, there's a, a question from Matteo that is interesting because uh, it was uh, also in my list of questions <laughs> for you. You is uh, uh, have you had uh, uh, a scariest moment in your career uh, in the U two? Uh, something you know, that I would say that uh, you know <laughs> the pro probably the scariest stuff I ever did in the U two was fly interview flights uh, with guys. <laughs> yeah, and the uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I would say the closest I've come to, to like really crashing plane and. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, and, and it's not, you know, you're flying with, like, everyone has to be experienced so that, you know, you're not getting guys who are like straight out of pilot training and never touched a jet before. A lot of these guys are pretty experienced. It's just the U2 is so different, the way it handles and the way it lands. And uh, so, you know, there, there were a lot of times that uh, with guys and, and on their first landings, and I know it's going to go to shit really quick. Uh, and so I'm ready. I have to, I'm pretty much have my hands on, you know, as they're landing, I'm, I'm sitting there. Uh, with my hands on the controls ready and, and following them on the rudders. And you, of course, usually they're not using the rudders, so that makes that part mm -hmm. easy. And, uh, you know, but I'm ready, you know, 
and it's always that kind of fine point, you know, really for any, any instructor pilot uh, that has experienced that, you know, with a new guy and stuff is what's that point? How far do you let them go? Um, you know, because they obviously have to fly. You can't just take it as soon as they make a mistake. Um, you have to let them make the mistakes, try to correct the mistakes. Um, and then, you know, it's sometimes it's just, it's getting out of hand. It's like, okay, we're going to crash this jet. And I've had sometimes where it's like, you you know, like I said, you don't want to bounce the jet. I've had, you know, suddenly you're, you bounce and you're 10, <laughs> 10, feet, 10 feet back in the air, but now you're, you've lost all your energy and you're about to stall the plane, you know, and you're going to, you're going to come down really hard then. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had some that, you know, just barely saved landings, you know, that, um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, besides that, that, that decompression story, um, I, I kind of mm-hmm. hinted that that was probably my other scariest thing. And, and I'm actually, yeah, I'm writing that up for another guy who'd asked me to tell him a, or write up a YouTube story for us for him. So, which reminds me, I, I promised him that like a couple months ago and I still haven't done it. So, um, it's a good reminder to get to that. Um, yeah, so that's why I would say okay. in general, okay. the scariest stuff. Yep. Okay. Uh, one last question before uh, we move. Uh, uh, has the U2 taken part in the, for sure, in the hunt of Bin Laden? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, Alessandro, who is also a, a combat pilot, uh, is asking about the operation uh, in order to... Yeah. To kill him uh, or just the hunt because i'm pretty sure for the hunt yeah. uh, it has taken no, part I, in several missions yeah and and I, I i have no no idea personally i i wasn't in that theater when when the uh that actual raid went down but i do know that for many years before that uh yeah. when i was flying over there um that that did consume a, a large portion of, of the uh, yeah. the intelligence you know and we're, we're always trying to gather intelligence on that um, and uh, in in that region where we knew he had been and where we suspected him going. So, okay. Um, so let's move to the photography part. Uh, how's the the love of photography uh, has converged uh, with the YouTube pilot uh, yeah. your YouTube pilot life? Uh, I mean, you simply brought your camera with you during a mission, uh, took some photographs, and, and so hey, these are great <laughs> yeah. great shots. I, uh, it, yeah, it, you you pretty much nailed it right there but uh the uh you know so i would say you know the the very first time you fly high in the u2 it's actually after after you solo so that's your first time flying flying the u2 in a spacesuit as well um but you know everyone everyone wants pictures you know on that that first flight you know because you're in a spacesuit in a u2 of course you need to have pictures so uh, you know, I started out, I had a little, I think it was like a Canon power shot something. This is back in 2005 when I was doing my initial training. Um, and the uh, pictures did not turn out looking like that. Um, they, uh, they were pretty, uh, I mean, I would say they're, they're compared to most people's photos. They're just so unique. You know, even if, if today I look at them and I can point out, you know, a, a hundred flaws with, uh, those earliest photos I took, um, it was kind of like, you know, I, this provides such a unique perspective. And even, even those photos I took on that little, you know, power shot camera years ago, um, I'd show my friends and stuff and you know, everybody is fascinated with them. Like, wow, that's incredible. You know, cause you, you really do, you see some of the curvature of the earth, you see the blackness in the sky, you see, you know, and you see how bright the sun is still, uh, up there, even with the black sky. And, uh, the, uh, you know, it, it just, it kind of fascinates people that, to see, see the earth from that perspective. And, you know, and it's kind of what made me, I, you know, I, I started trying to get better at just taking photos with that. Uh, and, and I, and I definitely progressed, I'd say, you know, getting better angles, stuff like that, learning how, how light plays into it, how the reflections in the cockpit play into it. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, it was, I think it was in 2009, it was right before my wedding. Um, and, uh, I decided to upgrade. I got a, a Nikon D90, and that was my first uh, DSLR camera. Uh, and so I started flying with that. And uh, the, uh, you know, I, I I basically saw that you know I I could put some work into this, and you know the first photos that came from that, uh, I wouldn't have gotten a shot like that from the Northern Lights. Um, <laughs> but you know I I saw that you know if I uh, if I tried to learn 
you know, some, some of the rules of photography, some of the principles, stuff like that, really try to get into in a more technical way, I could get better photographs by actually understanding, you know, what the settings on the camera do, how light plays into it, you know, and, um, you know, and how the positioning of the camera and stuff like that. And uh, so I really kind of, I kind of made it a goal early on once I got that that camera to learn, you know, to get some of the best shots I could. And uh, I spent a year in Korea when I, I was the assistant director of operations over there. I spent a year in Korea and I did a, uh, uh, had, a, I would say, a lot of time on my hands on on those missions, at least uh, to play around with the camera and, and try to try to learn that. Uh, and then in 2016, I decided I was going to finally upgrade even more. And I, and I actually got the the current camera I use today, this is a Nikon uh, D750 as a Tokina uh, 16 to 28 millimeter uh, uh, f2.8 lens on it. And I I got that camera and that lens basically, uh, I, I kind of woke up, uh, I literally woke up, it was several years back and, and I watched a video of a guy who, um, the guy who took a video of an eclipse from a plane. This is before the Great American Eclipse. This was a, one from several years before, um, and uh, I think it was on an Air Alaska flight. And you you could probably go on YouTube. You can find that. And it, it, the guy is like so exciting to listen. He he makes it sound like the most exciting thing ever on that video. And I watched that, and then I was reading. I saw that in an article about the Great American Eclipse coming up in 2017, and uh, Again, this was about two years before, uh, before that. And uh, I'm like, you know, I should try to get a shot of the eclipse from you too. I, you know, I, I looked at it, I'm like, okay, well, it's, it's in Oregon. It goes through Oregon. That's pretty easy from Beale, um, just to do a quick flight up there. Um, so how, uh, how did you plan? You, you had to plan, I, I mean, so, it's not easy. You have to, to be in the right place uh, at the yeah. right time and for the right time frame uh, in order to get uh, to that result that I yeah, need to show yeah. you in a while. The, uh, I, 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 did a, I did a write-up for Air and Space Magazine on this, uh, the planning, but yeah, so the, the, the short of it is basically, I, I basically had to look at it. So I, you know, I found the date, um, NASA had all the information on, you know, it's going to be hitting like the coast of Oregon at whatever, nine something a.m. in the morning. And it's going to be crossing, you know, it'll be through Oregon, you know, five minutes later or whatever, you know, it moves so quickly. Um, and, uh, so I started looking into planning a track for that. I actually had worked with one of my mission planners at the time to, uh, to build a, uh, a navigation track up there and then an orbit that basically orbited right along the line. So I kind of, I was in like a North, North, South orbit, um, and, uh, waiting for the eclipse to come. And I made sure I was going to be there at least, you know, I ended up planning it. So. I had some work room to work if we had any maintenance problems on the ground or anything like that. So um, I ended up getting up there about an hour early, uh, waiting for the eclipse. Um, but you know, I also had to plan how I was going to try to capture this because you know it's one thing to just plan to go up and see an eclipse, but it's completely different to plan how am I going to go up and try to actually capture this. And so my my original thought was I'm I was going to have several cameras working in the cockpit. Um, I had my my camera, which the 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 D seven hundred and fifty, which I got in two thousand sixteen. Part of it, part of the specs on that is I wanted to be able to shoot the eclipse, and I wanted to be able to shoot the northern lights, which happened later on. Um, but I planned to be shooting with that, getting a nice wide angle look at what was out there, uh, and uh, and I actually borrowed a camera from one of our public affairs guys. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a Nikon D D eight ten, I think. Uh, with a, a zoom lens on it and I put a solar filter on that and because I wanted to be able to try to capture the different phases of the uh, you know as the moon passed in front of the sun I wanted to try to capture it from each uh, you know both both before the moon passed and then as the moon's passing it out of the sun uh, away from me and uh, impressive so yeah, the uh, I uh, so yeah so I, I had I had the one I, I planned all this so that I'd have the, the wide angle lens basically rigged up and shooting continuously, uh, shooting time lapse. Uh, and that mm -hmm. was another thing I had to kind of learn in the U2s and how to, how to do time lapse, uh, the best settings for that. But uh, uh, shooting time lapse while I was trying to capture the, uh, the moon as it, you know, because I knew that, you know, even, even at altitude, even, even if I turned and flew with the eclipse, 
that I was only going to get a couple minutes with it at the most before, you know, so the moon's traveling so fast, you know, 1500 miles an hour or so over me. Um, so the, uh, I had everything set up and then, and then my camera, I didn't realize I hit a setting wrong on the back of that DA-10. And so the, the shots that I got in, in that picture, you can see the ones that you would call the, the like the diamond ring shots and so forth. Those were purely by luck that I got that. I took about 50 photos, uh, but right as the eclipse happened, I could no longer see the, I, I was, to use that camera zoomed in, I had to be, have my seat all the way on the floor, basically down as far as could go. And I had to be leaning down looking at the screen. <laughs> I could look through the through the, the viewfinder, obviously with, this, with the helmet on, but I had to be kind of looking at the back screen to kind of find where the sun was and I'd lost it. And uh, because I'd accidentally hit it over to movie setting. So I'm, I'm taking pictures just in the blind now as as the, <laughs> the thing was happening. Plus I, I, I had a Go, GoPro camera on me. You know, I wanted to someday try to make this into a documentary and I kind of had that <laughs> vision. You know, I didn't know if I ever would. I just like, well, I want to kind of capture it all. Uh, so I have that and I had a thing rigged in so I could, so my audio, what I was saying was was being recorded as well. And so most so, of the, most of the clips, it was curse words uh, throughout most of it because I couldn't figure out what happened to the camera. Did you, yeah. did you have to work a lot in the editing of the shot in order to make this, this, so I, I, I did. So I, I'm glad I, I had the camera. Did, I had it set right to at least shoot in raw. Uh, and so, you know, which I, I try to shoot all my stuff in raw anyways. But uh, again, this was a camera I wasn't as used to working with. But um, I, when I was on the flight back to Beale, it was only about a you know, 45 minute flight back before I started the descent back into Beale. But on the flight back, I looked at the camera, you know, look at the images on the screen. And I could tell I had some good images from before the eclipse. And then I figured out the problem with the setting right after the eclipse happened. And that's why I got some better shots of the, of the moon moving away from the sun as well. Um, and uh, all those shots look fine, but the 50 or so shots during the eclipse all just looked like a black screen. And I was so depressed that I had missed out on the eclipse uh, with this camera. You know, I'd, I'd had visions of getting these huge, you know, these great, um, zoomed in in focus shot with the corona and everything uh and uh, and i ended up having about four photos that actually had the you know the uh, eclipse on it and so that's kind of what i ended up with um so i was happy i ended up with that kind of uh you know snatched a victory from the jaws of defeat on that one um but i, I was when i when i landed of course everyone greeted me and like hey we want to see all the pictures and stuff i'm like yeah i look <laughs> Let me let me let me just I gotta put it on my computer. We'll look at it then, you know. So I, I was kind of there, put, there, playing it off. There's a question from Kedar, uh, who is also a great photographer, uh, one of the, the, the my favorite for sure, but yeah. one of the world's best. And he asks uh, whether you can share the the, the camera settings, uh, ISO, uh, aperture, uh, full wide or small, or any other detail about this shot. So I I believe on on the on the wide angle camera I had set up my camera with the wide angle lens um i believe that was set up with a uh with a full open aperture maybe just slightly closed with an iso of 100 so i believe the lowest base iso setting for that camera um and i believe it was the same uh for the the zoom lens and i i i'm just pulling this out of my butt i can't remember exactly what settings now i remember uh, i i had practiced with the uh, solar filter uh, to get the shots of as the sun was being eclipsed, but not during the total eclipse. I'd practiced the day before on the actual sun, like, and I was able to see like sunspots on those pictures. And, and so I kind of used those settings for shooting the sun. And then once the eclipse would happen, uh, I had to take the solar filter off because it was, you know, the, there's, there's just not enough light once the, the uh, total eclipse happened to actually capture it. So. Uh, that was another thing I was trying to shoot with that on initially, and I took it off. Um, but I can't remember exactly the the in in those shots exactly what the ISO and the uh, aperture were. And uh, what about the Northern Lights? That is uh, uh, another uh, yeah. <laughs> famous uh, <laughs> famous story. Let's say uh, did did you take the, those photographs during a mission that was. Uh, uh, 
uh, from or to Ralph Fairford, uh, if I remember correctly. So yeah, you... it, it was it was to Fairford, um, okay, and Fairford, uh, yeah. the uh, uh, that was the one time I ever landed in Fairford. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, I would say that so that mission, that kind of interestingly enough, like I I remember I said I bought that camera with those specs, and really the main the main thing I was looking for is I wanted to be able to capture the Northern Lights from the U-2. And I had never flown this mission before. In fact, I, I've still only, I done that. I did that mission one time. It was the one time I got these, these shots on it. Um, I had never seen the Northern Lights in person. I just knew the guys who flew this mission um, had, uh, had said, you know, they, they would describe them like, man, this is beautiful. It's like, but they, you know, they try to capture it with their phone or with another camera and like, mm -hmm. and I even had a guy, you know, he said, I, I don't think you can capture it with a camera. Like, I think to really describe it, you need like a poet to describe kind of the, the beauty of it and everything. And uh, so I kind of made it my mission. I'm like, okay, I want to learn. I, I already, I already like doing astrophotography or night photography on the ground. Um, so I needed to, I needed a camera that could that I could use in the U2 to take in a lot of light in a very short amount of time uh, and do it fairly, fairly well uh, without too much noise. And that's kind of one of the reasons I'm at that time I went with that camera. Um, it was also, it was, it was in my budget range. Uh, you know, if, if I had had $10,000, I could have gone a little bit better, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I got that cause it has a, a really good, a, a really good ISO. You can shoot it a high ISO. Um, and uh, uh, and that lens has a fairly wide aperture for a wide angle lens. It's a, you know, 2.8 aperture. So, um, and I needed that because I, after doing, I did some other night flights as kind of practice going before, you know, and I didn't even know when I was going to get to fly this Northern light mission. I just knew that, you know, I need, I need the right equipment. I also need the right set of skills to do it. Cause I didn't know if I'd ever get another chance to do it or not. Uh, so I, the couple chances I got to fly at night, uh, I, I went up and, and I kind of learned those settings. I learned how to shoot. But one of the things I learned is to capture anything uh, without too much blur in the U2, even with it with the camera mounted on something, which I tried different ways of mounting it. Uh, even with it mounted, you really couldn't shoot much more than, you know, have the shutter open for about more than a second. You know, and when you're when you're doing most night photography on the ground, you know, you're, you have the shutter open for, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds or whatever to let enough light in. And uh, so I had to find the settings that use a really high ISO, use a full open aperture, uh, and then only shoot for about a second. And, uh, and even at that, you know, probably one in 10 shots turned out okay. Um, and uh, so when I went into that flight, I basically, I didn't know what I was going to capture. I didn't even know uh, if it was going to be good, but, you know, I did, you know, Northern Lights don't just happen anywhere. It's, it's a, yeah. you know, it's a scientific uh, thing you can go on to uh, NASA or NOAA, you can see the ma a map of the Northern Lights. You know they form a ring around the uh, the magnetic North Pole, and uh, so I knew that my flight path was going to be going right through that ring, and I knew where uh, where it was, and uh, so I knew to expect it. But I didn't know how how much, you know. And you know and the other thing in the planning for this mission is that you know I knew that on this flight, I, I could, there was only about a four month window of the year where I could even do this flight. Uh, where it'd be dark enough up north uh, where I was going to be able to uh, for it to be dark enough up there to get these shots. So um, so I eventually got to fly this in February of 2018. And uh, I mean, I remember when, when I did the when I did the flight, I had everything set up and, and I had a, I had a really cool mount that I was borrowing um, from a public affairs guy. Again, I, I like to borrow equipment from him and I actually just realized I still have that mount. I got to give it back. But the, uh, um, uh, uh, I had all that set up to, to be able to mount the U2 and get some good shots. And I broke the mount, uh, uh, or I lost a screw out of it within the first two hours of the flight. So I ended up not having that. And I thought, Oh boy, here goes another, uh, eclipse like scenario where I'm going to miss it all because I, I messed up. But, it ended up be, it ended up working out kind of because I didn't realize how fast um, the northern lights were going to move. I had to change you know the settings on the fly pretty quickly, and uh, and I also was trying to capture stuff all around me. So I'm you know, I'm taking shots to the left, right, you know, and out front. And um, and the the funny thing is that looking back on it now, 
is at the time before this, I, I, I even had a shot list kind of done out. Here's the shots I want to get because I want to do a lot of time lapse. I want to get enough time lapse here, 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 and here. And not having the mount anymore, I kind of decided I was just going to try to freehand it. Um, but in, in all the time of planning this, I never planned to take a selfie with me in the Northern Lights. <laughs> and and it, was, it was literally, it was after I've kind of passed through this band. And now, you know, I'm kind of looking off on the right and kind of back to my left. And, uh, and I was kind of like, oh, this would be a cool shot. Like, I don't know why I didn't <laughs> think of that uh, beforehand. And so um, I tried several different ways with the camera, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, anybody that's, that knows about photography knows if you, if you have a really wide aperture, um, is it creates what they call a really shallow, shallow depth of field, meaning that basically I can either have it focused on the northern lights or I could have it focused on me. Um, but not both. And uh, so I kind of ended up working with the settings, kind of finding a middle ground where I, I could basically be in, in focus as good as I could, could find it and, uh, and the Northern Lights in focus. And uh, ended up taking a lot of shots. I have probably 50 shots of that. Uh, only a few of them, like I said, turned out good enough. And I ended up taking, um, taking several of those shots and kind of merging them together, blending them together. And uh, so to give some of the wider panoramic uh, shots that you've uh, you've seen, and you know the one that you had is my in, you know intro one, um, advertising this. Yeah. That that's probably the most famous one, you know, and that's actually three different shots kind of merged together. Um, and uh, uh, but I, I mean, all in all, I was I was unlike the uh, the the eclipse where I wasn't sure. I you know I came out of that, that flight you know after the sun came up and I landed. Uh, I I knew I had some great stuff and I was, I took over 15, something, 1600 photos. So yeah, something that, uh, uh went viral. I mean, uh, yeah. those shots, uh, made, uh, uh Ross Francomont, uh, extreme Rose, uh, <laughs> famous, uh, more or less all around the world. Uh, is that right? What, what happened? Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it was, uh, it, it was kind of a crazy thing. And, and, uh, the, the interesting thing, uh, is right before I flew that flight is when you had first posted the uh, stuff on yeah. the aviation as for some of my prior work. Yeah. And so I was already getting some interest in other media coming, uh, coming up to me and I'd already kind of talked with some of our public affairs guys at Beale. Um, and I won't get into all the, the, there's, there's a lot of drama in the public affairs world on, on what happened uh, during that. So, let's just say a lot of people were in favor for it. Some of them not so much, but, the, uh, um, you know, it, and the day of that, that flight, uh, because some of your stuff had, that you'd put up had gone viral and, and had gotten a lot of interest. Um, I actually had, uh, I was walking over to get in the spacesuit for that flight. Uh, and, uh, uh, someone called our, our crew desk uh, somehow a guy got a number to the crew desk from business insider and he wanted to get a few quotes from me. And I, like, I was walking over and like, sorry, I'm already running behind. Can't talk, you know? But uh, he wanted to, he didn't know I was about to fly a flight through the North, Northern Lights. And uh, so there's already some interest on, on that. Um, and then, you know, when I finally got home from England and was able to start working with these photos and putting them up, you know, it was a, uh, I was able to put them up on online. And, you know, I'd say very quickly, again, you picked them up and, uh, and uh, they, they went viral from there. Uh, and this one had even more immediate interest uh, than before. And, uh, uh, and this time it, it had some stuff that, uh, I actually did a little write up for some guys, um, uh, at caters news, which is based in the UK, but they, they then released this and, and a lot of news organizations, uh, picked it up, uh, within a day. And, uh, uh, I, I had become to get to know the public affairs officer pretty well at Beale by this point. And, uh, I remember I, I was going out to fly a formation flight with T-38 and, and he'd walked in the squadron and he's like, Hey, CBS news wants to, uh, do a, uh, wants to do an interview with you, you know, and they're, they're one of our you know, national news, uh, uh, agencies here in, in, uh, the U S and, uh, I was like, Oh, that's cool. Like, when, you know, when do they want to do this? He's like, in about two hours. And, uh, and he's like, well, it's gotta still be approved by the Pentagon. But so, uh, so I, I went on this flight, you know, this formation flight, leading this formation flight, knowing that I was supposed to come back and do an interview with the net, with the national news shortly after that. Um, and then they were going to air it about 30 minutes after that, you know, starting on the East coast. Um, and, uh, 
So uh, it, it ended up not working out. I ended up basically they pulled the plug on me interviewing for that right before it was supposed to happen, uh, even though it had been approved. And uh, and still that that went on the air. And that kind of, I mean, that that, that was a huge thing. Suddenly I'm being te texted by, you know, uh, all my friends on the East Coast and family and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I hadn't warned anybody. I didn't. Yeah, you know, I didn't know when I woke up that day I was going to be on the news that night, and um, so everyone's like, oh, oh, "Holy crap! I just saw you on the news here," you know. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, it, it, I mean, it, it was it was really cool, and uh, I ended up basically having to kind of pull the plug on a lot of the publicity stuff for a while after that until I retired, and that's when I kind of started back up last year uh, with my official retirement, and uh, and then you know I've kind of jumped it up a notch or so since, uh, since moving into this, uh, uh furlough category or, or uh, territory, uh, with the airlines now. So, um, the, all these photographs, uh, can also be bought back, can be purchased. Uh, I mean, prints, uh, on your websites, uh, tell That's, us a bit more, yeah. uh, because it's uh, already two hours yeah. that we are talking. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's a lot, you told us a lot of interesting things, but uh, one thing that I want to highlight is for all the uh, aviation geeks uh, passionate about the YouTube, but generally speaking, uh, people are always interested uh, in who are interested in the um, in aviation in uh, military aviation uh, can find a lot of your photograph, uh, not only. Uh, in the articles that I publish at The Aviationist, but also uh, on Instagram, Facebook, on your website. Uh, tell us a bit more yeah. about where they can find your stuff uh, and where they can also buy prints or uh, yeah. in, in which way they can contact you and so on. Okay. Uh, so so the main main website, I, I started a website, it's just extremeross.com. Um, and uh, uh, I've kind of built that from the ground up. It's uh, through WordPress, um, and I've basically had to learn a lot of web design stuff. But so through extremeross.com, I have um, a lot of my photographs. Um, I also like to do, you know, a lot of these stories. I, I you can probably tell I like talking about the YouTube, I like telling stories and things like that. So um, I try to put a lot of my stories on there. Uh, and uh, I've actually been doing a thing on Instagram, and I haven't been as active the last week or so, but um, I've trying to do a thing I call it uh, ask extreme Ross. And if you hashtag that, it should, you know, it'll, uh, you know, you can ask whatever question, uh, kind of like you, you guys have been asking questions on this. And a lot of those same questions have come up <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, you know, but, uh, I, I try to, I try to give, you know, not just a one word answer to them. I try to, you know, Instagram has a, a you know, think of 1500 character limit. I try to a lot of times use a lot of that. And I know Instagram's not using the, the, place for long exposition and stuff like that but um the uh i i've i've gotten a pretty good following so far uh with guys uh just you know at extreme ross uh, on instagram and uh um the uh you know and then i try to put the whatever i talk about on there I, i'll bring it put on my website as well um as like a blog uh plus some additional stories um you know, we talked about the chase car thing i, I have a whole thing talking about that there's a lot of video from that um, those videos that, that we wanted to play with the 360, yeah. those are going to, those are on the website as well. Um, the, uh, plus there, there's links you can go and actually download, uh, I would say about 90% of the photos, um, you can go, um, there actually, it links to a smug mug site where I have most of my stuff. Uh, most of it's free download. So you want a full resolution photo. Most of it, I would say is some of it I have is in what I call the premium category. Um, but there's a lot of those, and I think even the one that you used to advertise this, I believe, is in the uh, the free download category. So um, you can download a lot of those for free. You can purchase um, prints and and so forth uh, right from that website. Uh, and if you ever have any questions or anything, anything like that, you know, there's ways to email me on, on my website. Either you know, you can write Instagram through the website through per the purchasing site. Um, you can contact me if you have any questions, you know, the, uh, the photo I have behind me that that was actually a metal print. So I, I found that those turn out really good. The acrylic prints are really good too, at least for the colors and stuff like that. Um, plus they're already able to just be hung. You don't have to frame them or anything like that. So, um, the, uh, all, all that can be done through the extreme Uh, and, and I'm always, I'm kind of, I'm still working with them. It's, it's still a learning process for me too. And, 
yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I have some gear on there. I have some extreme Ross gears, stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I plan in the future to, uh, to, uh, I want to do a book, at least probably a couple books, but at least one, like a photo book, um, you know, kind of coffee table photo book. Uh, and then, you know, maybe another book talks more about the experiences and stuff like that, or maybe combine them in some way. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I hope to keep kind of pushing stuff out. I pl hope to plan to stay on Instagram. I plan to keep updating the website. Um, I have a lot of stuff from my 14 years in the U2 uh, that has not even, I've never put out. So uh, I'm still going through, I've probably taken 20,000 photos uh, in that time, maybe more. And uh, um, there's a lot of stories I've never told, a lot of you know pictures, stuff like that. So, um, so I'm hoping to kind of keep active at it. And, um, you know, at some point I'm probably going to transition to have just a more YouTube centric website. It's not as much extreme Ross, but we'll, we'll see, you know, so it's, it's kind of, um, you know, I'm kind of playing it out, uh, as I go. Um, and, and one, one other thing I forgot to mention. So, um, if you do, if you do decide to purchase any prints, uh, through, like, uh, through the extreme and, uh, through the smug mug site that it connects to. Um, there's a spot for a coupon code at the end. And if you just put in aviationist, just one word, aviationist, all capital letters, um, it's a 20% discount. So anybody listening oh, that's out great. today. Thank so, you. Thank you. This yeah. is, uh, this is interesting. Uh, I will write this, uh, also though. So in the, the comment section so that everyone, uh, uh, will see the, this live, uh, after, because this will remain, uh, on both the okay. page and uh, my profile. So that people uh, who watch these uh, later uh, will have for uh, uh, some time also the uh, possibility to, to use the coupon. Thank you yeah. very much indeed. This yeah, it's not a problem. Extremely much appreciated. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that uh, we have covered the most of the things that I wanted to to ask you. We have also had uh, uh, opened uh, the, this live to several questions. I think that we answer the you answer to, to most of them uh, almost uh, uh, all those that uh, were submitted uh, some were not taken just because you had already uh, responded in some way uh, as part of other uh, of other responses uh, so uh, I, I can but uh, thank you very much indeed uh, Ross for your time uh, for uh, uh, sharing with us uh, your your know-how your uh, uh, the stories uh, uh, about the YouTube. Uh, this has been extremely uh, interesting for me and uh, for all those uh, uh, who watched uh, this live and uh, who will have the opportunity to see this uh, recorded uh, uh, as it uh, will remain online. So uh, I, uh, I must uh, thank you once again. Uh, I, uh, I hope that there will be for sure uh, the possibility to, to have you uh, once again, uh, yeah. in the future, uh, maybe to talk about your books. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I think that uh, this is uh, interesting. Good luck with it. Uh, good luck yeah. with everything you are doing uh, with the Extreme Rose, uh, both the website or your social media accounts. Uh, these are worth a following because uh, you continue to push interesting stuff uh, <laughs> across all the uh, all the channels. Uh, so. Once again, uh, thank you very much to you, Ross. Uh, I'm not sure you want to add yeah. anything else. Uh, um, so, you know, just one thing, you know, I know that a lot of people ask questions and maybe you didn't get to, didn't, didn't get it answered here or you've thought of a question since then or whatever. So don't be afraid. Um, you can go over Instagram, Facebook, um, or just uh, on extremeross.com. You can write me as well. Um, and, you know, I, I try to answer stuff. I don't answer it necessarily right away. I like to kind of paste stuff out, but, um, if, if there's anything, you know, anybody out there, feel free to, uh, to ask. And I, you know, I will try to answer as best I can and, you know, in as much detail, uh, sometimes too much detail for people, but you know, it's, <laughs> I, I, people tend to appreciate more detail than not. So yes, um, we, for, for yeah. sure, we appreciate more detail. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that's, uh, something that uh, we appreciate a lot. So, yeah, but, uh, but def definitely, uh, thank you so much for having me though. It's been, it's been awesome though.
it's my, my pleasure and honor. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, every, everyone. Uh, I see that uh, people uh, are continuing to, to comment. Uh, they are uh, uh, thanking you for, for sharing your uh, experiences. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, I will stop the recording uh, uh, the live, uh, also okay. the live show. And thank you very much indeed to everyone. Uh, talk to you soon, Ross. Thank you very much. Right, thanks. Bye -bye thanks for everyone for coming. All the Excellent followers uh, at the Viationist uh, and the Extreme Ross uh, as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good night and good afternoon uh, in the US. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you. Ciao.